Prince Harry and how the French royalty all aspired to cosplay Rapunzel. A tale originating from 6th century Paris, France is about two princes who were going to ascend to the throne. They were kidnapped and the queen consort was given the choice, allow her grandson's hair to be cut or let them die with their luscious locks intact. She chose the sword over the scissors. One of the princes does manage to escape and he cuts his own hair and becomes a monk. In modern times saying alright kill him instead of a haircut does sound crazy, but back then men who had long hair showed their power and wealth. According to the Byzantine poet historian Agathias, it is the rule for Frankish kings to never be shorn. Indeed their hair is never cut from childhood on and hangs in abundance on their shoulders. Their subjects have their hair cut round and are not permitted to grow it further. In Germany men also typically wore their hair long, but they would tie it up in a bun or on the top of their head and sometimes hide it under a fancy hat. In general dark ages were a time where women did rarely cut their hair and there wasn't really any time period where short hair for women was trendy then. Lower class women typically wore their hair up in braids and buns because it was easier for them to work with while upper class women got to style their hair with more intricate processes using ribbons and metallic wires to help keep their braids and buns in place like a Leia. On the other end of the spectrum however, bold is punishment. To address why the grandmother would allow her grandson's death before a haircut, in today's world men shave their heads for all sorts of reasons. They could be naturally losing their hairline, have alopecia, or they're just prone to hair loss. However, in medieval times, hair was considered a symbol of power for royal men, as explained. Royal men never cut their hair, so the longer the locks, more powerful you're supposed to be. So as a man, if you let go of your hair, this was a huge sign of humility. If the grandsons from the first story had returned with shorn hair but are meant to be the throne's heirs, they would make the throne look weak and susceptible. Only monks would shave their heads, leaving a narrow strip of hair <laughs> horizontally around. Other times, only in the middle of a man's head was shaved and the rest was left alone. And of course, as you may know well from our other Dark Age videos, head shaving for women during this time was a degrading punishment as a woman's long hair was meant to be her most seductive feature. Number eight, blood transfusion. Back around 70 AD, the Romans were pretty wild when it came to the Colosseum and the games that would go on inside. There was uh, yeah, a lot of bloodshed and crowds would rush the arena after the day was done. Not to get autographs, but to hopefully hopefully get a sip of that sweet gladiator blood. Yeah, blood back then was a magical elixir. And then near the early 1500s, blood was seen as this youth juice. Yeah, you drink some young blood as an elderly, and then those knees, your patellas, would apparently start working again. A lot of theories surrounding blood back then. And in the Middle Ages, bloodletting was a go-to when you were sick because they thought your humors were out of balance. It is so hot in this goddamn In 1628, blood circulation was discovered by a man named William Harvey. That changed the game, right? Now, the idea of something going into your bloodstream was in the picture hypothetically. That's a little odd. So we started to test this out on canines. Scientists were injecting them with different substances and slowly but surely that turned into blood transfusion between animals, between canines. So this is back in the 1660s, right? That's how early we started injecting things with blood. It's kind of gross. Number seven, cataract surgery. Okay, don't tell him I told you this, but Kyle, my brother Kyle, our other lovely co-host on B, is blind in one eye. Yep. Kyle was born with a cataract, but you would never know because he plays rugby amazingly and somehow he reads this tiny prompter. I can barely do it with two eyes. No idea how you do it, man, you're a champ. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgeries in the book, well, rather in the painting. It was found in a tomb in ancient Egypt. It was a painting of what is surely the oldest recorded eye surgery. Scientists are able to make this conclusion due to the length of the tool that the doctor is holding. They believed this was a method called couching, which happened to be recorded. See, the needle would push the cloudy lens to the bottom of the eye, ideally fixing their vision. The oldest tools found in Egypt tell us that 4,000 years ago, this was the first time it had been done. But afterwards, evidence of couching was found all over the world. Now, it wasn't until 1747 until Jacques Daniel, a doctor in France, he performed the first ever cataract extraction surgery in a modern sense. He was the OG. Every method sounds wildly uncomfortable. Have you been through this? Like Kyle has kudos. Number six, skin treatment. As soon as summer comes around, honestly, it's game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter, right? I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did ancient Egyptians beat the heat back in ancient times? They didn't have banana breeze SPF 35. No, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. Yeah, you think your morning skin routine requires a lot of work? Buddy, read a book. Their routine was written on a tomb 
written on tomb walls and scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma arisenol. Yeah, that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Ancient Greeks would use olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You're burnt and dehydrated, but also you look good, okay? Tan lines, I see you. Number five, cancer treatment. All right, the big C. Cancer is something that obviously very is you know very prevalent in our modern society, and because of the rising rates, it makes us ask ourselves: Did cancer exist in ancient times? If so, where was it recorded? While they didn't call it cancer, it definitely did. Some of the earliest evidence of cancer is found in ancient manuscripts. Mummies, fossilized bone tumors that have been found in ancient Egypt specifically. There are tons of examples and different forms of cancer that have been found throughout. Perhaps the oldest comes from 3000 BC. And it was found, like I said, in the Edwin Smith papyrus that we talked about before. Now in this text, it describes eight cases of tumors or ulcers of the breast and how they treated them back then, or at least tried to. See, back then these tumors were removed by cauterization using a tool called a fire drill. Other than this though, the text says in reference to the illness that there is no treatment. So in ancient times and today, we're still trying to figure this one out. Number four, tooth extraction. You may not think of surgery when you talk about tooth extraction, but this for sure counts as surgery. This, yeah, I've had a tooth pulled. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. Every time something gets removed from your body, I'm gonna count that. And if there's definitely blood involved, yeah, I'm gonna count that. Getting a tooth pulled is still so barbaric. Even today, they don't like slice a line and then gently slide the tooth out or anything surgical. No, they just have two dentists grab your tooth at the same time, put their foot up, and then yank it out. I was numb, sure, but it was still weird, okay? Back in the day, pulling teeth was done not to make room for braces, but to solve any problem, or well, all problems, regarding your teeth. Yeah, cavity, gone. Toothache, Ugh, see ya. Oh, some plaque, no problem. <laughs> Today, we're lucky to have x-rays and modern technology, you know, to tell us if a, a tooth is coming in sideways or which ways. But back then, some believed that it was tooth worms. Yeah, this feeling over here could be a worm. Go get it checked out. Could have worms in your head. Gross. Aristotle and Hippocrates wrote about dentistry around 500 BC, and the way they would handle tooth decay or extraction was by using metal wires to fix wobbly teeth or even a broken jaw aka ancient braces. Number three, trepanation. One of history's oldest surgeries. Trepanation was also, it was, it was the worst, it was horrible. To this day, we're not even sure why this was a thing, but we picked up a few ideas along the way. Let's talk about it. Turning the clocks back to thousands of years ago, trepanation was the practice of drilling holes into your skull. A popular theory is that trepanation was done to release evil spirits. Yeah, let's drill some holes in our skull and see if our mental illness just goes away. That'll help. As barbaric as this sounds, skulls found in Peru hint that this procedure wasn't as fatal as you'd first guess. The reason this would happen was also to clear out bone fragments after skull fractures, right? So you show up with a headache and leave with a hole in said head. But honestly, the fact that you're leaving at all is surprising, given the time. They didn't have any advanced medical instruments, but they did have sharp ones. This was the first surgical procedure, it was around 6,500 BC. The term trepanation comes from the Greek term trepanon, borer to, you know, to drill. Number two, rotting whale body. Okay, not all these are not disgusting. One of the most strange things on display at the Australian National Maritime Museum exhibit has got to be the whale carcass treatment. This is an odd treatment. Now the cure for rheumatism back in the 19th century was to crawl inside of a dead whale's body and uh, yeah, just hang out for a bit. And by a bit, I mean a full 30 hours. After that point, you would definitely be healed for at least 12 months. Yeah, it began in the town of Eden, obviously a whaling town on the southern coast of Australia. Only while this was happening, it was kind of funny, the user's head would be poking out of the whale. Yeah, like the world's worst sleeping bag, all tucked in there, getting better. It all started when an intoxicated man stumbled into a dead whale body, passed out, and then when he woke up, his rheumatism was cured, just like that. Yeah, from pale ales to pale whales. No more achy joints for you, my friend, let's do it. And finally, number one. Egyptian nose job. Plastic surgery is more widespread now than it ever has been before, but it's all because it started a long time ago, especially in the ages of the ancient Egyptians. In the Edwin Smith papyrus, along with the documentation of trauma surgeries, bone fractures, fixes, and all that jazz, this text also shows examples of fixes for nasal injuries, which I gotta kinda seek. I have to seek some of that right now. I think I need to get my nose fixed. Can't breathe a lot. The treatment involved manipulating the nose into the desired position before using wooden splints or lint or swabs, anything really to hold it into place. 
you know, it's an ancient nose job. That's crazy, right? It's truly wild to think back about how much, you know, these people had shaped our world and lives, especially our medical world today. While so much of the civilization still remains a mystery to us, right? It's crazy how much we still know and how much we still don't know. Number 10, snake eyes. Well, not exactly snake eyes, but after extended use of belladonna drops in the eyes, you would probably wish that a snake bit you in the eyes. Belladonna is poisonous. It's a no calzone, red flag. But yet it was still used by Egyptian royalty. Basically, the drops of poison would dilate your pupils, and that would be considered to be beautiful for some reason, I guess, okay. Extended use of the drops had terrible side effects for the user, blindness being one of them. You gotta remember, folks at this time have no social security, and the best doctors can do for you is tell you to go take a bath in crocodile dung, and to pray to the gods for more, I guess. Sure, okay. So to avoid that tragedy, go for the natural look and avoid the eye drops. You'll thank me later. Number nine, more eye stuff. Thought I was done with the eye stuff? Ah, well, guess again, amigo. I ain't done yet. I've got lots more to say about that. Okay, maybe a little. Eyeshadow and eye color. Some ladies today would say no special outfit is complete without it. And honestly, I have to agree, ladies. Sometimes y'all do some stuff with your eyes that makes me say, damn, you look good. Damn, you look good. However, some ladies might be cautious to slap some color on their face if they knew the origins of the product. As for the royalty of Egypt, eye makeup was in. Seemed to be a trend. However, they weren't so cautious of where their makeup got its origins. Egyptian eye glitter had two key ingredients, applicable powder and bugs. Yeah, you know the super colorful ones that are like really big and you wouldn't want to be around? Yeah, those, beetles, scarabs, and pretty much anything you could find. They would then crush them into a heavenly pulp and smear it all over their royal faces. I have issues with spiders and wasps as it is. I have no interest in wearing them whatsoever. I actually hate wasps. That's just, you mean just crushing up a bunch of, and just, oh, this is good. Oh, I love this. This is the best. Yeah, no, don't do that. Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Whew, here we go. Nowadays, you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal, Seashells, and when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells, can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clam shells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember, when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay. In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no, like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw, okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. 
By using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin, long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse. Back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm gonna to stick to the spearmint. S spearmint. Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again. Who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for? Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that it would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one just hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting, I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign. But a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <sighs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? Well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are a mass of excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. 
It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault, a vault, with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. Number 10, wash your hands. No, seriously, go, go wash your hands right now. When was the last time you washed those filthy nests? Go wash your hands. Washing your hands is super important, especially these days. But something that's very unusual about the Aztecs compared to a lot of other civilizations in history is that, well, they did wash their hands. Oh, and you have no idea how happy that makes me. No more shall I have to think about people shaking hands after using the bathroom with no toilet paper. That's disgusting. Or scooping food onto a plate with their bare, dirty hands and sharing that food with the rest of their families. Yes, the Aztecs like to wash their hands before and after a meal which is just the way it should be. I hate having grimy hands. You know, I talked to the chief today, and you know what he said? That's it, that's actually it. Yeah, we like that, that's it. Number nine, Aztec Barbershop. It must have been quite the sight for Spanish conquistadors to land upon the shores of North America and then come to bear witness the Aztec civilization in all its glory. Something noticed by the curious Europeans was that the Aztecs had what looked like a barbershop for men. After all, a healthy scalp is a happy one. Even more interesting than that, however, is women were dyeing their hair with a green herb that I'm not even going to begin to pronounce. It was just too hard. It was a lot of X's and T's. I couldn't do it. Which produced a purple shine to their hair. Some women even shaved their hair off, while older women, like mothers, had longer hair. Man, it's almost as if a beautiful civilization was starting to flourish. Well, I'm sure nothing bad ever happens to the Aztecs, right? Number eight, Doormad Toothpaste. We've mentioned some horrible lipsticks and face powders, so we need to mention this disaster of a brand. Moving past the days where your barber pulls out the problem in the 1940s, we had toothpaste. Yes, we had it, this is good. In fact, we had the most powerful toothpaste ever to this day. It was called Doramad. Okay, yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says, radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Okay. These cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is hindered in their destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mild, refreshing taste. Ah, yummy. Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this existed once, not too long ago, is just wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. What would their slogan be today? Doramad, accelerate your breath. Number seven. Shards and Sharts. Oh, you thought we were done with the bum bum history. I think again. This is a part four, and honestly, I could do four more parts 
on wiping alone. It's a pretty big deal, it's nuts. We don't realize how lucky we are. During the pandemic, for example, one of the first things people stocked up on was toilet paper. It's worrisome to not have six rolls on standby. You start getting anxious, right? You're like, oh, but what if I eat some lobster? I don't know, whatever makes your tummy upset. Now you know a little bit more about me. But nobody did it like the ancient Greeks, and I mean nobody. Survey says ancient Greeks would wipe using broken pieces of ceramic. Oh my god. They would even sometimes write the names of their enemas, I mean enemies, on this piece of shard and then wipe. Isn't that wild? It's like, ah, I'll show you by wiping with ceramic with your name on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, this obviously led to major health problems and according to the British medical journals, three pieces was often enough. Three is still a good number today. That's a comfortable fold, but ceramic, no, there's no way. No way. It was the better alternative, believe it or not. The other was actually sharp seashells. Number six, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was even born, what did people do to smell good? What? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. Nothing like speed stick at all. Not even close to being discreet. You can't put the stuff on the bus. It's not, they're gonna, what's that guy doing with that jar of goop? Ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs when it came to ancient deodorant. They made perfumes and were amongst the first to try any type of deodorant. So thank you. Thank you. Hence the ostrich egg factor. Mixing a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shells, nuts, and then bam, you're ready for the day. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. Egyptians would also use porridge balls. Flavored porridge rolled up and then safely secured in your little apple pitter fritters right there. Just don't wave at anybody or else you'll, mm, there you go. Number five. Shampoo. When my hair grew longer over the pandemic, I had a huge wake-up call. I had no idea what I was doing. I only used the guy's shampoo, you know, like the classic four-in-one shampoos. That wasn't working anymore. I needed some curl cream. I needed shampoo and conditioner, separate things. It takes time to figure out what works with your flow, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders. They would just dip their hair in cold water at a public bathhouse, also very public, and then rub and scrape oils away. Lime wire was also used to wash your hair back then, but that was horrible. It's just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all. They would just rub their head with bran before bed and then brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. Honestly, guys, I'm not gonna lie. There's something they're not telling us. It was too nice. Number four, aqua tofana. Not to be confused with Aquafina, which is also pretty horrible, Aquatafina was hot in the 17th century. This was a straight up poison that was marketed as a cosmetic. This was during the late 1600s and it was first used by two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofania Di Amato. They used this cosmetic, this makeup, so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. It's named after its creator, a lady named Tofania, who was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through who we believe was her daughter, Yulia Tofana. She took this deadly recipe all the way to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and perhaps belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. This cosmetic took over 600 lives. Brutal. Number three, baldness. So what if you're going bald, but you don't have a massive 16th century stupid wig, then what do you do? Well, back in those days, if your hair started to thin out or you were losing patches, you would need a mix of chicken droppings. Yeah, chicken mixed with potassium. Okay, this ancient advice comes from a man named Peter Levins. He wrote this method down in 1654 as an alternative to lice-infected wigs. Both sound absolutely horrible. Honestly, I think I'd rather the lice-infected wig. At least then you can just take it off. Number two, sailor's delight. Life on the sea was all but a sea breeze. And even today, you know how hard it is to take a on a boat? Whale watching's fun and games until your stomach decides it's had enough of the sea and wants to go home. While it's a rockin' and rollin' way of using the loo, how did sailors do it back in the day before anything helpful? Was it easier being far away from the general public? Was it helpful that water was all around the place? Honestly, not really. That's when a tow rag comes into play. Yeah, anytime the word rag is used, you're not in for a good time. Near the head of the ship where the toilet was, this little indent or whatever the toilet, it wasn't a toilet, it was a hole, there was a single rope with a rag, and when it wasn't being used, or shared rather, the rag would be tossed over the side of the ship so it would just dangle in the water and wash away all day, which is fine, I think, I'm not really sure. The sharing is caring thing, I'm not on board for, pun intended. Do you fold, do you scrunch, or do you use barnacle rope? How do you do it, guys? Comment down below. Number one, Q-tips. I love Q-tips a lot. I do two at the same time, and then I flip them, and then I do it again. 
Yeah, I get them twice. The first one for cleanliness, and the second one because it's for me, because I feel like it. Sue me. My eyes roll right back. It's the best. If COVID tests were done through your ear, I'd be getting tested twice a day just for fun. Q-tips, most of us know by now, weren't exactly made for cleaning your ears. As much as we only use them for that, Q-tips were invented in 1923 by a man named Leo Gergenzang after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Sounds a lot like she invented Q-tips, but sure, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. Baby Rays is like, mm, too close. Sweet Baby Rays is like, way too close. Our, our sauce is not even close to that product. Back in those days, Q-tips were actually dipped in boric acid first before being shipped out. They were intended to sterilize wounds. After this, there was even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams, Q-cards, whatever, you name it. Anything that made you a QT. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be used in your ears? Like, sorry, what? What's that all about? Is that real? Well, in 2008, autologist Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax further into your ear canal, leading to possible infections. When Chesborough Ponds bought the company in 1962, they added the warning on the box. A warning we all gladly will still ignore, like I said at the beginning. Mm. I take one look at my earbuds and I'm like, yeah, I need four Q-tips right away. I need Q-tips yesterday. Number 10, the Switchblade Comb. Hey, leather jackets, smacking jukeboxes, and a Switchblade knife. Nobody was cooler than the Fonz on Happy Days. Well, maybe your uncle. Everybody has a cool uncle. But something I just think is silly, or something a lot of men probably use today, or at least the super cool guys who have no idea what or who the Fonz is, the switchblade comb. Basically, it's the same thing as a switchblade, but instead of a small blade, you got something to comb your hair with. Because when you're a man, you have to look fresh and tough at the same time. Trust me, ladies, it's, it's how we operate. Gotta look tough, gotta look mean. And kick the jukebox, Hey. Number nine, the ball jacuzzi. I don't know about you guys, but there is nothing better than a nice hot tub. I'd like to say I spent a lot of time in hot tubs with cute girls. However, due to my financial situation, however, most of the hot tubbing that I've done has been at public pools where I shared a hot tub with older Italian and Greek men who I swear were still wearing sweaters, but that was just their hair. Speaking of hair and saggy skin, meet the Tescuzzi, a tiny hot tub for the pizza deal and two matzo balls. Hey, I understand, your undercarriage has to stay clean and honestly, I would love one. Chris and I were talking about we want one, we might even share one. Who knows? Number eight, there's not a visine for that. Does anybody else sneeze when they look at the sun or is that just me? Do I have issues? I have a handful of allergies and one of them apparently is a star. That's neat. My eyes are literally always dry. I think I forget to blink. I'm not really sure what's going on. But today, there's a visine luckily for everything. Eye drops are common, but written in the oldest book of medicine, the Ebers Papyrus, chock full of ancient Egyptian medical recipes, it contained old optical treatment. Even in Egyptian artwork, you can find ancient cataract treatments. British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard found these clay tablets from ancient Babylonia around 625 BC, and treatment for dry eyes was a little different than today. Today, all you have to do is and you're good. Back then, you had to get chemicals from plants and then mix them with prayers. Good game, good luck. One ancient tablet described the treatment of the time saying, if a man's eyes are affected with dryness, he shall rub an onion and then drink a beer and then apply oil to his eyes. Just mix all that sh put it in your mouth and then thou shalt disembowel a yellow frog mix in its gall and curd and apply it to its eyes. I don't even know what the f that means. Like imagine getting that on a prescription. You're like a yellow frog, what? Number seven. One night with Venus, two years with Mercury. It wasn't too long after humans discovered toe curling that as much fun as that may be, there can be some unfortunate side effects. Knowing somebody in the biblical sense can transmit not so fun diseases if you catch my drift. Like syphilis, early stages being sores and uncomfortable rashes, late stages having much more serious side effects, like blindness, heart disease, and oh yeah, it can make you go crazy. So throughout history, and especially before there was antibiotics, how do you treat a disease so common amongst people participating in the devil's dance? Liquid mercury, yeah. People try to treat a disease by consuming liquid mercury. When applied to the skin, it burned. Therefore, if it hurts, 
It works. It was noted that syphilis would go away after mercury treatments, but this could have just been a stage of the bedroom rodeo disease as its symptoms disappear right before things get bad. This is also assuming that people taking mercury aren't getting sick of mercury poisoning in the first place. This practice continued way longer than it should have as it wasn't until discoveries made in the 1900s that a better option for treating the brothel related illness. Honestly, with this kind of logic, anything's possible. Sky's the limit when you're crazy. Number six, the great stink of 1858. It's one thing living through a pandemic, but at least we're not living through something called the great stink. Yeah, the great stink of 1858. Who was responsible for this? What did you eat? What happened? Well, this was an event in central London and it lasted for a few months in the summertime too, which is just great for great stinks. It was so hot and dry that the Thames dried up, leaving just sewage, just all that gross you can imagine. The smell was so bad, Parliament had to close for an entire day. I wanna know who the first guy was to be like, you know what, nah, I'm going home. This sucks, this sucks. Good call. In order to continue work, Parliament had to soak the curtains on the riverside of the building in lime chloride just so they wouldn't be sick. They just soak it in chloride to be like, that's better, it's better, we think. They were on the verge of moving their entire operation to Oxford, that's how bad it was. Members of the committee were quitting their jobs. While this sounds all bad, hundreds of tons of limes were being discharged into sewers to help the smell. So if you had a stuffy nose in July 1858, you could have made 1,500 pounds a week just messing around with limes. You missed your shot. Number five, the human fly trap. This is honestly so five head, a brilliant play might be one of the best moves I've ever seen. Have you ever been to a picnic with a nice sandwich, some fresh crisp potato chips, and an ice cold lemonade as you sit on a warm blanket, enjoying the view just over yonder? When all of a sudden you are attacked by a swarm of bugs that just ruin the vibes, and now you don't even want the sandwich. Who made this lemonade? It's so bitter. I don't even like chips. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt felt the same way, except they had a great way to deal with it. Simply take a few of my servants and slather them in honey. Place them away from our royal picnic and bada bing, bada boom, you got no more flies bothering you or your sandwich. This honestly sounds completely cruel and at a time when hygiene in general wasn't great, how did they get all that honey off? Sure, a dip in the Nile will get rid of most of it, but you'd probably just glaze yourself for a crocodile's lunch. Honey will get stuck in places where the sun don't shine. And just like shame, you can never really wash it off. Number four, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over, honey. I burn so easily. I have freckles for two days, then the rest is just red and un just bad, all bad. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? They didn't have Banana Breeze SPF 35. What did they do? Well, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Yeah, buckle up. Their routine was written on a tomb wall and also scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol and that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Just some chick named Jasmine, she was like, don't look at it, just stop. Ancient Greeks used olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, did absolutely next to nothing. You'd be burnt and dehydrated, but you know what? Can line, so. Number three, Red Dead Bandage. America, 1864. There's a polite disagreement between North and South whether the South should be still using YouTube's least favorite S word as a business practice. The verdict, it wasn't very nice. That aside, the Southern states fought hard for a very stupid reason, idiots. Such a hard fight in the fact that it was taking a serious toll on everyone specifically the southern economy and civilians who got caught in the raw end of the deal. The war was a huge cost of life and money for both sides, but the south just didn't have the same resources the north did. So, after years of fighting, things weren't looking too good. An example of this was the south washing and reusing bandages as supplies were low and casualties were high. This might be hard to stomach, but that's just what happened. Nurses washed the blood off of blood soaked rags and bandages to reuse simply because there was no supply. I don't have to be a doctor to tell you that reusing bandages in a time before antibiotics is a bad idea. It might be better to just not have a bandage in that case at all, as the chance for infection would significantly increase. Dutch, you got any fresh band aids over there? I scraped my knee fight with Micah. Hurts real bad. Maybe get John to kiss my boo boo better. Number two. Ancient socks. Somebody got me socks as a gift over the holidays, and let me tell you, 
Still the best thing you can get. Socks and lip balm, you can do anything you want. Game over. Socks in ancient Greece were not the right and left neon green athletic socks that you have today. No, not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC, made fresh from, you guessed it, animal hairs. Yeah, it was gross. This actually led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then tying them up. Cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins, and it was softer, lighter, and all that jazz. And then later on, in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Socks were associated with the church, they were considered a symbol of purity. Yeah, you heard it. Socks would go all the way up to your leg, a little different than the New Balance ones we have now that just go up to your ankle, that, you know, fall off when you're halfway to work and then make you really upset. I have one right now, I'm gonna go figure it out. Number one, heavy stomach. We as humans need food and water to live. Water honestly being number one. I mean, I could eat a little bit more, but water's more important. But it is what it is sometimes. People in the past had no choice but to build water pipes out of lead. Sure, maybe it wasn't common knowledge that the lead was toxic, but a lot of people did know. So that's why all the cities that sparked up during the Industrial Revolution were built with such. Lead as a material did make sense, as it was cheap and easy to use. So that simply outweighed the health risk of lead poisoning. Lead was a common material in other products as well. But when your drinking water is supposed to be fresh, maybe it's time to spend a little more so we don't end up, you know, spending a lot more on healthcare for lead poisoning. After years of being underground, the pipes corrode and leak toxins into the water stream. It's why in older cities, a lot of time and money is spent today replacing old pipe infrastructure. To me, it's a classic case of, eh, let somebody else deal with it, I'm sure it's fine. Well, I'm off to go work in a completely safe asbestos factory. I'm sure there's nothing wrong or bad in there. <laughs> Number 10, made of stone. This one disturbs me so much and it's terrifying that it hasn't been solved yet. If you're a Game of Thrones fan, which hopefully you are, you've heard of Grayscale, the disease that like poor Shireen Baratheon suffered in the series. Yeah, you know what I mean? Well, it may have been inspired by something that actually exists. Though there is a one in two million chance of getting it, it does happen. What is it exactly? Stone man syndrome is a condition where the ligaments, tendons, muscles all slowly turn into bone. It starts with a stiffness in the neck and shoulders and then gradually moves down the body. Imagine having two different skeletons in your body, that's kind of what it is. What's even more heartbreaking about this mysterious disease is that you can't remove it. In fact, any attempt to remove the bone makes it grow faster and come back stronger. I hope they come up with a cure as soon as possible as currently there isn't one as to why it's a medical mystery. But because it's so rare, it makes it even that much harder to cure it because they don't have that much on file. Anyways, let's keep going. Number nine, Sirenomelia. I pretended I was a mermaid countless times as a kid and still do every time I do a dolphin kick in the water because I'm like, <laughs> I'm a mermaid. But I kind of don't want to be and I'm kind of glad I'm not because of this. Sirenomelia is the condition in which a child is born with their legs fused together in a way that makes them look like a mermaid. Sadly, it doesn't have a happy ending as most children born with this defect don't live very long. The two most famous cases are that of Tiffany Yorks, who was the oldest living survivor, living to the age of 27, and Shiloh Pepin. Patients of this condition barely survive the womb or the first few years of life due to organ issues that follow the disease. The exact cause of serenomelia remains unknown to this day as it appears to be a random occurrence and there's no way of predicting it. Number eight. Bald face. In another video on things too woke for this era, I talked about how it was once cool to have no hair on your face at all. I can't grow any facial hair, so this is this reaches out to me. This is good. I like this. I like punching in on this fact. Well, Queen Elizabeth I was the first to bring this idea into Western culture. She influenced women to completely pluck their eyebrows, and on top of that, they would also shave their hairline back as far as they could, so their faces would be as large and as big and bright as possible. Just right there, like the big moon. Just. It was common for women to soak bandages in a mix of ammonia, vinegar, walnut oil, all to hopefully, hopefully suppress the hair growth on their forehead. Facial hair was removed, but body hair, that was left untouched. The Catholic Church also influenced the look. Growing your hair out was a feminine display until you went out in public and had long hair. Then it was immodest. Because, of course, number seven, loincloths. Okay, I have to adjust the jeans for this one. Going back to ancient Roman and ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Neat. Either that or you would just be naked. So, you know, if you're a nudist, great. Hit the thumbs up if you're a nudist. I don't know. I don't know why I said that. We're gonna keep going. I found this neat step-by-step -step on the internet how to make your own loincloth. And it's a bit more complicated than throwing on sweatshorts and calling it a day. We don't have a lot of archeological evidence today because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather also to make underwear, which is, just imagine that, I'm like, ha, it's hot. 
hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but we'll save that talk for another time. Number six, breast bags. There's a neat term, breast bags. Let's bring that one back, see if it sticks. Now, contrary to what I just explained over at point number seven, women, more often than not, didn't wear undergarments in the Middle Ages. Up here, at least. But in 2008, at Austria's Langburn Castle, something that resembled a modern day bra was discovered. It's believed that only higher ups, ladies of nobility rather, were the only ones who had the privilege to wear these breast bags or breast cups. I say breast bags, sounds a little funnier. We have bags of milk in Canada, so you know, I'm connecting the, yeah, that's, that's, I gotta connect the jokes. I can't say much personally, but this does not look supportive enough at all. It's like a pirate flag, it's like ripped apart, this is nothing. If you have back problems, I don't think these breast bags are gonna help you. If you're ever catching up on some 13th century readings, well, now you have an image when you see the word breast bag. This, this eye patch that they called support. Number five, cesspools. Ooh, gross transition. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where to build certain rooms. Like say over a cesspool, for an example, that might be important. Just plug your nose. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, cause you know, you, you poop and then gravity and everything goes down. But you need to make sure that those floors are supportive enough. Because in 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt, but the floor in the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through the floor, with a few of them even drowning in that cesspool. What a horrible way to go. Then again, in 1326 England, Richard the Raker had just sat down for dinner, guys hadn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor broke and he fell through and drowned. I'd say chamber pots were safer, definitely, but when it comes to waste, honestly, just out of sight, out of mind. Just get that away from me. Literally, pun intended. Number four, towels. I'm pretty picky when it comes to towels. I always have to have way too many just ready to go at all times. You know, in case I want a bath, in case I want to have two baths in a row, you never know. Today we have nicer towels at hotels than anything, honestly. We all know somebody with a Bahia Principe resort towel in their closet and you're like, really? Really, you thief? Okay, I'm telling. Around the 1800s, flour sack towels were the best you'd get. Now around this time, suppliers were packaging flour and other foods in these cotton sacks. This saved big time on barrels and eventually they were cut into tea towels. Now come the Great Depression, resources were of course limited, so these flour sacks were used now for multiple reasons. Clothing, toys, quilts, pillowcases, diapers, and of course, towels. Wouldn't feel too good on your back, not at all. Number three, same clothes, new day. King James, and no, I don't mean LeBron, I mean King James VI of Scotland this time around. We'll talk about him another time. He had a pretty sweet idea when it came to changing clothes. You don't. Simple as that. What a dream, right? The amount of times I change my shirt every day for literally no reason, it's such a waste of time. It's like black, mm, gray, mm, black. Yeah, that's it. It's a waste of time. King James would wear the same clothes for months at a time, even wearing the same hat for 24 hours straight. He was devoted to the hat game. He just slept like, didn't move a muscle. He went as far as not bathing either because he thought that it was bad for his health. Yeah, things were thought differently back then, as you may have known by now on this channel. James became king when he was just 13 months old and he succeeded Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1603, he took over as ruler for both England, Scotland, and Ireland for 22 years. And he looked the same every day. Gotta, gotta love it. Who's committed? Number two, unwanted hair. Pubic hair is a biological mystery, and yes, even after we hit puberty, we still can't figure it out. What are you? What's going on? So far, we believe this is part of our evolutionary history, and it comes from a time where we needed fur all over our bodies, right? Like animals. We evolved to protect ourselves against the cold, and just in general to keep that area, you know, safe. I don't know why I did that sound, but it's safe. So why is it that ancient Greek statues of women are completely hairless? Well, this was a time where if a woman's area was hair free, for some reason, the Greeks symbolized it as being pure. Okay. So in order to be considered pure, you'd have to use razors and creams, pumice stones, methods that were not as smooth as today. What's even more annoying is that men who would grow their body hair out, that was a sign of maturing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either of these categories. I can't grow anywhere where I want to. It's just bald, I'm just a bar of soap. Yeah, I'm not gonna use a stone to shave either. Thanks, we'll pass, next. And finally, coming in at number one, acne. Ancient Egyptians and Greeks came up with an interesting method of getting rid of those pimples. Now, reminder, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing. 
You ever click one of those videos and you're watching for like 40 minutes? You're like, I'm gonna be sick. Is that yogurt? What is that? Physicians back then discussed these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing these mysterious spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then, so that's pretty horrible. That's gonna be in my head forever. They would refer to severe cases as maggots that lie in bed of roses, aka your face. That's the bed of roses. If a physician told me I had maggots in my face, I'd faint. Teeth worms and maggots, like just brush your teeth and wash your face and then avoid all that smoke. These disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals, so that's pretty wild. So ancient Greeks and Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds to solve that problem. Or what I just do is I just squeeze really hard, yell one curse word, and then wipe the mirror. That's usually how I do it. Number 10 is chloroform the hiccups away. Nowadays we know a nasty case of hiccups is curable by just holding your breath or chugging a bunch of water. But if this was 1899, you'd be prescribed chloroform. Known by many as the mysterious liquid on the rag placed over the, someone's face to make them faint in many period pieces or cartoons, chloroform gained popularity after Queen Victoria demanded its usage during her labor in 1853. After having been denied it in her previous labors. By taking these lengths to reduce the annoyance of hiccups, your vital organs may pay a steep price. Chloroform has the potential to damage the nervous system, lungs, and trachea, as well as the liver and kidney when exposed long term. This is just one of many medical remedies that we'll be covering from the first Merrick Manual of Diagnosis and Therapy, the oldest continuously published English language medical textbook. All the quack treatments in our list today used to be found in this mass encyclopedia. For instance, number 9 in our countdown is smoke inhalation for asthma and other lung conditions. This may be one of the more counterintuitive remedies on our list, as it's easy to see now that smoke is not beneficial for asthma at all. Through the late 19th and into the next, however, inhaling smoke or smoke, as well as stramonium, a hallucination inducing nightshade, as well as lobelia, known for its sedative properties, were popular treatments for asthmatics. Asthma is caused when your airways can narrow or swell while producing excess mucus. Smoking meanwhile has been shown to eventually reduce the number of cilia, the lungs filaments which help transport mucus into the lungs, which only leads to the worsening of asthma symptoms. This wasn't the only weird tobacco smoke belief however, in 1872 an English newspaper talked of tobacco smoke enemas which even reported that hundreds of lives might have been spared by the tobacco smoke enema. Okay, weird enough. Number eight, bath beans. Not to be confused with bath bombs, bath beans we're talking about. Bath beans, beans in the bath. Bath beans were used thousands of years ago in ancient China. They were these bars, or beans rather, these chunks, still like beans. They're made of bean powder, herbs, and much like our bath bombs today, they also included some nice fragrances. Just have a little bit of a, mm. The pancreas of a pig was also commonly used, so it wasn't totally nice. Once the blood was drained, you'd mix it with the bean powder and the nice stuff. Now originally it began by using leftover water from cooking rice. Eventually it became bath beans, which is, you know, aka soap. Old soap. Some bath beans were loaded with ingredients, much like the bath bombs we can find today, so they were all quite unique. You could make your own little bath bean. Number seven, purple nut sedge weed. Archaeology is fascinating. And no, I'm not just talking about dinosaur stuff. They look at rocks and be like, ah yes, a viking was here thousands of years ago and he was a Libra. How do you know that? This is so impressive. Ancient sites tell a story. And Karen Hardy, an archaeologist with the Catalan Institute for Research and Advanced Studies at the University of Barcelona, she found another ancient hygiene practice while studying a prehistoric site in Sedan. Plaque, it turns out, can last thousands of years. It calcifies once it mixes with food, then after it's stored below the gums, game over. It's there for good. Specifically, thousands of years ago, it's, it was there to stay. We couldn't really get that out. Hardy was studying remains that were two to 9,000 years old, and in their teeth, they found traces of pollen, dirt, and plant fibers. More specifically, they found evidence of a plant called purple nut sedge. It contained lysine, which is an amino acid that we need to live, so although it didn't taste the best, it sure was vital. Ancient Egyptians used the root for perfume, but this new study shows that purple nut sedge may have been used to prevent tooth decay. They would just chew on roots all day to take care of their teeth. The plant produces antibacterial chemicals, so chewing on them would have been beneficial. Little different than the inside of a tortoise, I'd say. It's definitely a step in the right direction. Number six, smoking. Back in 1665, during a plague in London, you were told to smoke cigarettes because they were considered disinfectants. Sore throat? and eh, smoke this pack of cigarettes. I'm sure that'll help. Help you cough a bit more, if anything. We mentioned before tobacco smoke enemas in like part one or two or three or something over there. But this is just bad advice. Since mouth to mouth wasn't a thing in the 50s, if you were trying to save a drowning victim, you would also have to blow smoke in their face 
or their butts. Either way, how insane is that? Can you imagine that actually playing out in real time? He's not breathing, quick. Hang on. Cut to 1964, turns out smoking is bad for us. Who knew? Cigarettes were labeled as deadly going forward after that point. It's pretty intense now though, eh? The photos on cigarette packages now, they're haunting to look at. I still think teenagers smoking to stay in shape is a bit scarier to be honest than that image. She's always like, her face is just like pulled, so scary. Don't smoke. Number five, face care. So we've gathered that folks in the middle ages didn't bathe often, but when they did, it was just the necessities, right? They didn't have time to, you know, Old Spice all their stuff up like they do. Then time to dance in the shower and shower backwards. It wasn't a fun event. Hands and face, that's it. That's all you really need anyways. If you couldn't afford to walk and shower back in the day, you'd have to invest in an ewer and basin. You would all have to share the same thing and take turns dipping your hands and face in all day long, just the same. Hmm. Protecting your face was vital for ancient Egyptians 6,000 years ago. They would honor the gods with makeup, but at the same time, it would also protect their skin from the sun. We love that. Today we have like SPF creams. I'm like, this is nothing, this is no fun. Ancient Greeks would use oils to clean their face and they would later scrape it off. And in the 1700s, many believed in saunas and sweat cleansing. The number one trick to clear skin, you guessed it, milk baths. Milk is really the name of the game for this part seven, eh, wow. Goat milk mouthwash, milk baths. I'm gonna go milk a cow after this video. Just because, you know, feels right. Number four, Python bile. Yeah, I just said Python bile. So if you're eating food right now, I'll just I'll, I'll give you a sec, hit that pause button. Not only pythons also, but numerous animals, their bile would be used to treat ailments. Ulcers of the female genital area. Yeah, that's what the doc was giving you. Python bile, have fun. Ancient Chinese physicians would also hand over some elephant bile as well if bad breath was bringing down your game. Elephant bile mixed with water would get rid of halitosis. Honestly, any type of bile, just count me out. I just won't brush, how's that? Taylor, why do you have bad breath? Oh, have you seen the alternative? That's why, Mike, that's why. I almost tripped, but that's why. I almost broke my leg. I'm upset about bile. Number three, malaria. Perhaps one of the most bizarre ways to treat one disease definitely is by getting another. If you suffered from syphilis back in the early 1900s, there wasn't really much help you could get. That was until Austrian physician Julius Wagner Joreg came along. He received the Nobel Bell Prize for this discovery, and as bad as it sounds, it's honestly quite the breakthrough. Julius discovered that malaria-induced fevers were the key to treating syphilis. Ye nice. Now we're, I guess, we don't do this anymore because, well, malaria is still horrible and a hefty amount of patients lost their lives trying this method. So no, we at Bumblebee do not recommend this method. We have other ways to treat it now. Number two, rabies. It's a part seven. Let's talk about rabies. Might as well. This is a haunting list so far. Pre-rabies vaccine, I mean, what the hell did we do? Before 1885, that's when French scientists Louis Pasteur and Emile Roux, they developed the first rabies vaccine. We were pretty much SOL if a rabid animal were to bite you beforehand. I mean, one of the leading theories to prevent the spread of rabies was to not let your dog outside while there was a full moon. You know, that middle-aged bull where every remedy just sounds like a side quest in Skyrim, that kind of stuff. Oh, you'll need one egg and two pigeons. I'm like, what? I have, a, I have strep. What are you talking about? In 16th century Europe, it was a literal joke if you had rabies. Doctors quite literally told you to ingest 40 grains of ground liverwurst and wash it down with 20 grains of pepper and a half pint of milk. That's it, that's how you cure rabies. That's how you do it, I guess. You gotta ingest that each morning for four days in a row. Oh, and you also need to have a cold bath every day for a month. Imagine if this really was the only solution, even today. Just cuts to us in 2022 with iPads, technological advancements, we're creating new vaccines, but in order to cure rabies, you still need to slam some milk and have a bath. It's like, yeah, that's the only way. That's the only way we've done it so far. Hygiene history is insane. I'm gonna push for a part eight. Hit that thumbs up so I can keep talking about this nonsense. This is insane. I learn something horrible every day here. And finally, number one, electricity. Electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, has been around a lot longer than most of us think. It just didn't work back then, you know? Also, we don't call it shock therapy anymore. We're well past that. Tiny electric currents would be sent through your brain, ideally changing its chemistry, and over 1,000 people a year undergo this treatment. But back in ancient Roman times, this procedure, of course, was a little sketchy, just a little wee bit. They would use electric eels. Yeah, they would hang out with a bunch of electric eels to hopefully relieve a headache. Again, I'd rather just have a headache. I'm not trying to become a Spider-Man villain, okay? I just, I'm nearsighted. Today we believe the seizure aspect is beneficial, but back then it was believed that electricity was the key here. We would drink electrified water and wonder why nothing's happening. Kicking off the list at number 10, hot topics. 
Over in Finland, they're changing the game. The sauna over there is considered a national institution. It's a large part of both Finnish and Estonian cultures. These saunas are commonly found surrounding Finland's lakes, corporate headquarters, and, oh yeah, of course, the parliament house. Saturday in Finland is traditional sauna day. It's not Saturday for the boys, it's just Saturday and we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in each other's mouths for a bit. I can't even fit into a bathtub. I look like an octopus trying to escape a jar. It's not relaxing, it's not a good Saturday at all. I wanna move to Finland. When government leaders can't agree on an issue, they take it to the sauna. How amazing does that sound? In the middle of passing a bill, dudes will just pause and then go hit the sauna. We need this over here. Finns describe the sauna as a secret weapon behind their diplomatic advances. Director of the Finnish Employers Confederation described the ritual saying that it's easier to discuss problems openly. It's like when we're doing a presentation in class, they always say to imagine everybody naked. Well, this was just that scenario played out in real life. Take away the briefcase and tie, you're just a naked dude sitting on a bench talking about inflation. Kind of an odd picture when you think of it. Number nine, the outhouse. One thing I am glad I don't have to deal with anymore is outhouses. Not that I ever did, it's just something I don't want to do. I called the chief again last night and uh, he said it wasn't it, again. Outhouses have been around for a long time. Technically just a hole in the ground where the business is done. It wasn't until later a small wood shack was built around said hole. And then it became an outhouse. Because the design of the outhouse is quite simple, there is a few design flaws that really just don't make any sense. Okay, yeah, it had to be built away from the house, as it is a pit full of refuse that exit a human being. But it's also built away from your house. So if you gotta go bad, I mean, you gotta go bad. You might not make it. This also is not so fun if you live in a place where it's cold and you have to dress just to take a leak. But really what is the craziest thing is that after a certain time, that hole is going to fill up with an unholy godliness I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And now you gotta move it somewhere else. I know they wouldn't fill up that fast, but after a few years living in the same place, there'd be a few holes everywhere and that's, that's just not good decoration, is it? Not to mention, if you were living in the time of the expanding west, an unseen rattlesnake or scorpion could make the potty time your last. I'll just stay indoors, thanks. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing, unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health and so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun-kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status, but simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well-known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters so she put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth and yes, slowly you understand. Number seven, Victorian laundry day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when laundry day came around, it was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping the up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry, hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe, and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also cover the wigs in powdered scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, 
there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn, but the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. And yeah. Number five. You're in deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day, and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes, and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it? Number one. I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee. Because it's so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mmm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years. The bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, it was just not, it was like basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's meal times, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a shit. I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be. Just jump. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. You know, you have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair and perform other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I, have, no, I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction, obviously, today. Horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls. But where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. 
They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way. So they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Beautiful. Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how did we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course. That was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number eight, no spitting. Spitting was a common habit back in the old west. You see it in movies and parodies are always spitting on the ground and stuff. Well, it's cause it's real. It's a real fact right there. It wasn't officially outlawed. However, many towns and cities did prohibit spitting on sidewalks and inside of public buildings. Cause yeah, please don't do that. Thank you so much, sir. This was largely due to concerns about hygiene and of course, like I said earlier, the spread of disease. In addition, spitting was considered rude and uncivilized behavior. Yeah, of course, and many people were offended by it. Middle of conversation, guy just spits in between your feet. I'm like, wait, don't do that. Please don't do that ever again. Some businesses even had signs asking customers to not spit on the floor. Can you imagine what kind of hole you're in? You have to ask people not to do that. There was also social norms in place that discouraged spitting in certain situations. For example, it was considered impolite to spit in the presence of a woman or in formal settings, which, yeah, I agree. Still do that today. That's great. Despite these efforts to discourage spitting, it remained a common practice among cowboys, miners, and other workers workers in ye old west. They're like, yeah, I have shit in my mouth. I don't know, we don't have water. I'm gonna spit, sorry. Number seven, communal towels. Ugh, this one's so rough. It's exactly what you think it is. It was a ride. Today we have paper towels that you pump like 13 times just to get a little sheet. Or sometimes, if you're lucky, that Dyson air drying thing where you just dip your hands in for like 13 seconds and then it's done. You're like, oh, the future is here. That's always fun, that one. Back in the old west, communal towels were often used in public restrooms and other shared spaces. Yeah, just one towel for all, just a dap off everything that's wet or damp back then, ew. These towels were usually made of cloth and hung on a rack for multiple people to use just in public, like it's your bathroom. While this may seem unhygienic by our modern standards now, it was a common practice at the time. So yeah, I don't know, we can laugh a bit, I guess. People were generally less concerned about the spread of germs and diseases back then, and communal towels were a convenient and they were a cost-effective option for public spaces. However, with the rise of awarenesses about hygiene and germs and all that nasty stuff, the use of these towels Towels eventually fell out of favor in the earliest 20th century. Thank God. Imagine dapping off your lips after eating some wings with a communal towel. Some cowboy is, you know, huh, and then he, huh, and then, huh, 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 and then you come in and wipe your, that's so gross. Number six, hair care? Yeah, I added a question mark there because, I don't know, not much TLC going on on top back then. Throughout history, people have used a variety of natural ingredients for hair care. Nowadays, guys have it too easy. It's like Axe 5-in-1. 
It's like hair, armpits, legs, feet, all in my, no way you can do all of that. Popular methods in the Old West were whiskey and castor oil. Yep, all on your big exposed head, right in the sun, there you go. Pantene Pro-V wasn't a thing then, so folks were rubbing their heads clean with castor oil, that's a nightmare. Whiskey was believed to help cleanse the scalp and often promote hair growth, while the castor oil, that option, that was thought to moisturize and condition the hair, so that'd be a fun two-in-one back then, that's great, put that in the stocking. These ingredients were readily available and most importantly, they were affordable, making them popular, but also, realistically, it was their only option. The guys doing whiskey, he's like, yeah, let's clean it up. Clean up top. It's so hot. It's like, ugh, really burns. Number five, medical shows. Today, medical shows, they're fascinating. Dr. Pipple Popper, I'll watch that all day while I eat. I don't even care, I'm disgusting like that. Dude's getting mashed potatoes squeezed out of their back, so I'm like, ah, let's go, I love it. I'm slapping that thumbs up, it's my shit. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s, you know, they had what's called medicinal showmen. These are, what an absolute joke, what a con. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, everything one needs to live a happy and comfortable Western life, but they were full of lies. None of this shit is true. These professional medicinal showmen would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience before these random demonstrations of amazing medical elixirs, right? These shows, bunch of bullshit. They would call up random audience members, that guy that ran ahead, and then use one of these elixirs and magically treat their ailment on the spot in front of the public, right? Almost as if it was a magic show. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any and all illness. But in reality, it was just an extremely strong laxative. So yeah, if you're gonna take it, make sure you're close to home. Yeah. Number four, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, old West saloons with the swinging doors and stuff, a few catchphrases and a cowboy with some whiskey, all that good stuff. The bartender back then would pour a drink, the cowboy would take the bottle instead. So illegal, sir, that's that, please put that back. Back in the wild, wild Western days, grabbing a drink at the bar wasn't like that at all. It wasn't like anything you see in the movies. It sucked. Bartenders, they had no regulations to follow behind that dirty bar. But not only was it very high proof, but some bevy like tarantula juice was just, it would just poison you. It was literal poison. If its name didn't tip you off, it was literally made with poisonous ingredients. Because that was, that's how cowboys did it back then. But they're hairs. I don't know. Tarantula juice was made from strychnine. If you drink it, you're going to feel like there's tarantulas crawling all over your skin. That was their pitch back then. They're like, eh, happy hour. Come get tarantula juice. I'm like, awesome. Thank you so much. How do I not tip? Which button do I press to not give you money, you freak? Number three, grow it out. In the old west era of the United States, men often grew their hair long as a practical choice rather than a cool fashion statement. You know what I mean? All those bandits with their long hair. They had to. Living in the rugged and often isolated terrain of the west, men had to perform many physically demanding tasks like hunting, ranching, mining, pouring whiskey drinks and tarantula juice. Long hair would help protect their scalp and neck from the sun and wind and all that good stuff. But it's important to note that haircuts were not always easily accessible back then. And many men back then could not afford them or did not have access to a barber. It's like, I can't cut it. He's like, where? We don't have anything. We don't have dental. What do we do? As a result, growing their hair long became a practical and functional choice for many men back in the old west rather than, you know, style. And they were going for looks back then. They weren't doing man buns, doing the cowboy thing. They're like, no, I have bugs. I don't want you to see my bugs. I'm to grow it, thanks. Number two, outhouses. This one here stinks. In the wild west, outhouses were sadly common as indoor plumbing was not yet available. Didn't think of that yet. So these structures were often simple and consisted of a small building, if you wanna call it that, with a hole in the ground for your Huh, your waste disposal, if you want to call it that. Now, due to the unsanitary conditions and lack of proper waste management and knowledge and, you know, knowledge about germs and stuff, outhouses could attract a variety of insects and other pests, and it was just bad to go in there. Flies, mosquitoes, other bugs, they were commonly found in and around these structures, and they could potentially transmit diseases to humans. So, if you're in there, you really get your business done and then get out. You don't want to waste time. You're not checking any tweets while you're in there, that's for sure. Despite the unsanitary conditions of an outhouse, they were a necessary part of daily life in the Wild West. And people learned to tolerate the bugs and just deal with it. Because they're like, you know what? This is better than going on outside. Whatever's going on out there, we're good. Close that up. One time I went to a cottage when I was younger and my mom didn't tell me that they had only an outhouse. No running water the entire week. And I was like, awesome, let's turn around, I guess. I'm not doing that. I held it for like seven days straight. It was a nightmare. And finally, number one, 
broken bones. I'm lucky enough to have never broken a bone. I mean, knock on all the woods. But what if you did back in the old Western days, right? Then what would happen? But is a cowboy gonna heal you up? No. What if you were trying to learn a kickflip and you broke your leg? Then what? What are you gonna do? If the dental plan was any indication, it's... It's not pretty, not a lot of options. In the Old West, broken bones were a common occurrence, particularly among those who worked in physically demanding jobs, like ranchers, miners, cowboys, around livestock, those things kicking you randomly, something's gonna break. Treatment options were limited and often relied on first aid techniques, you know, splinting the affected area with whatever materials were available, such as wood, cloth, or even animal hides. It sounds crazy, but back then, that was really the only method for immobilizing broken bones. Pain relief, that was only provided with natural remedies, such as oak or willow bark tea, so. You're gonna feel that entire healing process. It's gonna suck. More serious fractures, like ones that, you know, go through the skin, those require the attention of a doctor or a surgeon. However, you know, those medical professionals back then were not always available in the remote areas of the Wild West. No helicopter's gonna come in and grab you and then take you out, no, it's. Number 10, Hutchinson Guilford Progeria. HGPS is one of the rarest conditions in the world. It is a condition where the body dramatically and rapidly ages beginning as early as childhood. So it's kinda like Benjamin Button except backwards. Most of the time you can't tell at birth as they usually look normal, but as they age and grow, they do not gain weight. Their facial characteristics also become thinner and fragile looking, their eyes and ears protrude, and their features like their nose and lips become thin and beak-like. The condition also causes alopecia, which is hair loss, and they lose their fat beneath their skin. However, intellectual development is uninhibited, and their motor skills don't suffer either, so they're literally just trapped inside this body. But sadly, the condition does not have a very long life expectancy, as they often suffer heart attacks and strokes at a very young age. There are approximately 100 documented cases where patients lived into their 20s. Currently, the cure remains a mystery. Number nine, allergic to the cold. What? I mean, I am i don't like the cold, but mm? to clarify, not a cold, but the cold. Entirely opposite to another case on this list, there are actually people in this world that are allergic to the cold. Right, then that's not just like them like shivering in the wind. Like, I don't mean that, and I don't mean your aunt who flies to Florida for Christmas. I'm talking about breaking out in rashes. The condition is called cold urticaria. Even slight exposure can result in a welt, and jumping into cold water could result in a full anaphylactic shock. Imagine how much of a problem this is. Like, the cure still eludes doctors, but they may actually know the reason. Dr. Gerald Gleisch at the University of Utah studies patients with the condition. He says that it appears to be due to an antibiotic called immunoglobin E. This antibody causes the inappropriate immune reaction and it may hold in store the cure. So far, only antihistamines work a little bit, but it still remains a boggling mystery as to how things could go this wrong. You know? Very, very strange. Plasters, no, not the British word for band-aids, is number eight. This medical treatment was said to have sucked the badness out of a person. They were like a nicotine patch made up of a thin layer sheet of wax as well as leather, and it was able to stick onto the skin. In the wax, there were remedies such as lead, opium, frankincense, tobacco, etc. This mix would be applied while still warm to ensure the adhesion of the plaster. Plasters were sold to anyone of any age and came in many different shapes and sizes so that they may be applied to different areas. What were they used for? Everything. Cough, cold, period pain, organ failure, alcoholism, headache, the list can go on forever. Seeing as they wanted the patch to pull as much badness from the body as possible, these patches could be left on for two days to two weeks to forever. Without washing, of course. Naturally, these patches trapped in a lot of moisture that could cause infections, blisters, rashes, and hives underneath, especially once the patch is removed and the skin is finally exposed to air. Arsenic, like plasters, was a cure-all, and it's number seven in the countdown. If you've seen our other video, Top 10 Unusual Fashion Trends from the Victorian Era, you might know that arsenic was in everything in the Victorian era. Makeup, wallpaper, dye. No exception was made in medicine either, as arsenic was prescribed for anything from anemia in Merrick's diagnosis manual, to anthrax, cancer, reduced libido, syphilis, or even cholera. While it was most popular to consume arsenic, it could also be inhaled or injected. Being a byproduct of smelting, it's no wonder arsenic was everywhere during the Industrial Revolution, as there was an excess of it. So it was incredibly accessible and a household remedy. 
since doctors already prescribed it to do so much, everyday people just start to use it to treat any common ailment. Unsurprisingly, many people suffered arsenic poisoning symptoms. The ailments are now referred to as Fowler's disease. Number six is all kinds of gross and questionable. The everlasting pill. When the Merck manual was first published, part of the comprehensive treatment plan for an eruptive fever, which is a classification for diseases like scarlet fever, smallpox, and chickenpox, was actually laxatives. Castor oil was the main laxative choice for Victorians up until the debut of the everlasting pill, made up of a metal now known to be toxic called antimony, would be invented. Swallowing this would induce severe vomiting and diarrhea, thus giving the body what they thought to be a healthy cleanse, and their intention was to purge diseases from the body. It earned the name the everlasting pill, as the pill would pass through the gastric system mostly intact, meaning it could be retrieved and cleaned for future use. Seeing as the metal was greatly valuable at the time, it was quite common to keep it in the family and hand it down generation to generation. Imagine getting that in your granny's will. Watch out, it may shock ya. Number five is shock treatment. When profit can be made off of insecurity, unsavory business flourishes. Victorians honed in on the man's moral weaknesses as a cause for erectile dysfunction, and impotence was thought to be caused by either too much sex and masturbation or not enough. So doctors took a few shocking routes, literally, such as galvantic baths or bathtubs filled with electrodes, which were supposed to restore sexual desire in an advertised six sessions. For a more direct approach, a thin rod with running electric current could be placed up into a man's Repeat that twice a week, about five minutes each time, and your little man should be ready to rumble. By the late 1800s, ads were running for electric belts aimed at weak men. They claimed to help cure kidney pain and sciatic nerve issues and back aches and headaches and nervous exhaustion, and of course, mainly their dysfunction. While today impotence is recognized as the result of physical or mental duress, age, or genetics, the belief that electric shock therapy is a useful cure for impotence still persists, and some studies have shown positive signs. See that, fellas? Don't knock it till you. Try it. Speaking of electrocuting genitals, you can't tell me that didn't happen at least once with the first electric vibrators, which is number four in our countdown. Female hysteria became a diagnosable medical condition way back in medieval times when the concept of a wandering uterus, when a discontented or displaced uterus would cause a woman ill health, was first coined. Believed to have symptoms such as irritability, insomnia, fainting, anxiety, menstruation, or horniness, pretty much every woman showed these symptoms. Hysteria was pretty common. Doctors cure hysterical paroxysm and orgasm. For hundreds of years leading up to this invention, doctors were manually administering pelvic massages to women to achieve the necessary cure. But all that wrist work added up over time and doctors needed a break. So cue Dr. Joseph Mortimer Granville. He created an electric steam powered electromechanical medical instrument, nicknamed the manipulator. The device allowed women to give themselves home massages to cure their wandering wounds and giving doctors the well deserved break they needed. A questionable cure for a very questionable diagnosis. Number three is not for the faint of heart. They loved leeches. It may be crazy to imagine, but between the late 1700s and well into the early 1900s, there was a booming leech trade all across Europe. Leeches were shipped from Germany to America by the tens of thousands. England even had to start importing them from France by the mid 1800s as their own leech stocks were not even enough to supply their own doctors. Francis Bersoyas, believed that all diseases resulted from the excess buildup of blood and documented this belief in a medical journal that would subsequently cause leeches to become the go-to treatment in France and then later spread across Europe. This usage of leeches then became worldwide from there, and so obscene that the creatures started to go extinct. However, what these quacks didn't know is that bloodletting was very, very, very rarely beneficial to any conditions, and applying leeches often resulted in detrimental side effects such as blood blood loss, diarrhea, and vomiting, or those with poor immune systems could even be exposed to hazardous bacteria and infection, let alone death from hemorrhagic shock for literally anyone they did this to. Eventually, the excessive use of leeches meant that they became too expensive to ship, too scarce due to the over farming to find, and medically obsolete in the face of new science that questioned the medical merits of bloodletting. Thank God. Number two doesn't allow you to touch where number one usually comes out. It's the masturbatory mental illness. Obviously. It's natural, normal, and well, fun, but the Victorian perspective of masturbation was nowhere near what it is today, as our old timely friends saw it as a serious threat to mental and physical health, or even could 
you. Self love was seen as an ultimate evil, but beyond moralistic arguments, many physicians thought that every orgasm drained a man's energy. Married men were warned by doctors to limit the amount of sex they were having, while unmarried men were encouraged and urged to conserve their essence by avoiding sex altogether, particularly masturbation. Even wet dreams and uncontrolled ejaculation were considered a sexual dysfunction, as masturbation essentially became the male version of hysteria. So, how did you treat this condition? Men had to stop masturbating. Fear and shame campaigns did what they do best and stimulated the market to provide quick quack remedies. They came in the form of anti-masturbation devices that looked like torture chambers. Most popular was the jugum, which was a metal ring attached around the base of a man's, you know, and then screwed on. If he was to become erect at any point, whether awake or asleep, the now inflated skin would make contact with sharp metal teeth that would dig in. Like I said, most popular. Consider how much worse these other options were for that to be the primo choice. A spermatic truss was essentially the first jock strap, but meant for every day. And the Bowden device fastened a little metal helmet to the end of a man's member that bound up into his pubic hair so that it would be ripped out should he become erect. I'm more than happy to keep going, but I'm sure more than enough people are wincing right now. Keep in mind, while these men were going through this to avoid masturbation, women were being prescribed it as a cure. Number one on our countdown may be a bit of a surprise, surgery. How could surgery be a questionable treatment? Well, it itself isn't, but the men performing it and their hygiene towards surgery were. Most famous is Robert Liston, said to be able to remove a leg in 30 seconds, he notoriously used his own mouth to hold scalpels, knives, and even once sucked the pus out of a woman's throat wound. According to medical historian Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, surgeons never washed their instruments or their hands, and Victorian surgeons were known for wearing old surgery garments out of prowess, reportedly so stiff with old blood that they were nearly cardboard in appearance. Even the operating tables themselves were rarely washed down, and it was said a visitor to St. George's Hospital in London 1825 discovered mushrooms and maggots thriving in the damp, dirty sheets of a patient's bed. When asked why they hadn't complained, the patient assumed this to be the norm. And what about surgery in the moment? Well, the patients were conscious and undrugged as they were operated on, and surgeries needed to be fast as a result. One in four people died after their surgery, whether it was still on the operating table or from infections afterwards. But what about our buddy I mentioned, Dr. Liston? Only 1 in 10 of his patients died. This was because of his speed. Time me gentlemen, time me, he'd shout to the surgery spectators to put his legendary speed to the test. Sure, he did accidentally castrate somebody once because of his wild motions, but nobody's perfect. In fact, while he's remembered for being the first surgeon to use anesthesia, wash his knives, and invent a still used medical tool, he is the only surgeon to ever have a 300% death rate. I'd be remiss not to mention that during a leg amputation, his lightning speed reportedly cut off three fingers of the assistant who had been holding down the patient. Then as he brought the knife back up, he slashed the coat of a spectator. The spectator reportedly died immediately of fright, likely a heart attack. Though the assistant and patient survived initially, like most who were treated in Victorian hospitals, they died not long after from infection, which was also just called hospitalism at the time because of how many people died that way. It's easy to say that going to a Victorian Victorian surgery or a hospital may have been as efficient as rubbing dirt into a wound. Kicking off our list at number 10, dental surgery. Back in the ancient Egyptian worlds, it's not like you could just take a quick trip to the dentist to get your teeth checked out and cleaned, yada yada, and then you go home, whatever, right? The diet of the average Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, conductive to having an impeccable set of pearly whites. That's mostly due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which you know, would naturally destroy your chiclets. And through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time that have been discovered. And it's pretty horrifying, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, an ancient abscess. We love those. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found from the fourth dynasty. This mummy, in his first molar, was a bunch of surgically produced holes that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some, you know, very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were in fact happening all those years ago. And before we head into the rest of this list, we also have to remember that all this was done, or most of this was done, without anesthetics, right? No one's gonna put you to sleep, and then you wake up and you're like, oh, my teeth are gone, what happened? No, you were awake for the whole thing. It sucked. 
Number nine, Egyptian stitches. Yeah, gotta talk about Egyptians once again. I'm gonna talk about them quite a bit. They're the OGs. Just in general, while surgery did exist during ancient Egyptian times, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because, well, obviously, like I just said, no painkillers, no antibiotics, the list goes on, right? No fun. One thing that's less invasive, but still extremely important, was seen quite a bit during these times. Use of stitches. Yeah, I've never needed any in my life, thank God, knock on. Knock on wood that I don't need any stitches. Ancient Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own sutures in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers or hair, or tendons, or wool threads, anything, right? In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus that came from ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described. 48, imagine being one of those 48, that's kind of epic, not gonna lie. Number eight, sour cream hands. Nice, that was my nickname back in elementary. In the past, old sour cream was occasionally used as a home remedy to alleviate chapped hands. Nice, let's do it. Taco Tuesdays, let's do it. The rationale behind this practice was that the lactic acid present in sour cream could, maybe, potentially, not really, help exfoliate dead skin cells and moisturize the hands. Sounds gross, but it kind of worked sometimes. The creamy consistency of sour cream was believed to create a protective barrier, preventing further moisture loss and promoting healing. However, before you go in and ruin your taco night at home, it's important to note that this remedy lacks any scientific evidence and may not provide long-lasting or optimal results. Yeah, sour cream, just keep that on your, keep that on your wrap, not your hands. Then you're all set. Number seven, Nux vomica. In history, Nux vomica derived from the seeds of Strychnos Nux vomica tree, very poisonous. It was an occasionally used as a remedy for headaches. Not a good plan. This practice was based on the belief that the seeds contained compounds that could alleviate pain. Sure, again, good attempt, bad landing. Nux vomica was thought to have stimulant properties, increasing blood flow, relieving tension, all that good stuff, which in turn could provide relief from headaches. However, it's important to note that the seeds contain strychnine, which is a highly toxic substance, one of the worst of the worst for humans to eat, and their use as a remedy is not supported by the modern medical knowledge at all. Safer and more effective treatments for headaches are now available. You don't have to be eating any poisonous nuts. Thank you so much. Number six, urine. In ancient history, urine, P, number one, it was sometimes used as a medical treatment due to the belief that it possessed healing properties. Yeah, pour it in your eyes, see what happens. Don't do this. The practice can be attributed to various factors, including cultural beliefs, limited medical knowledge, of course, and the symbolic association of urine with bodily fluids and purification. Yeah, that last one's a big one. One reason urine was used as a treatment with this historical connection to the concept of uroscopy. That's where the color and smell and taste of urine was examined to diagnose illnesses. Yeah, some dude would be like, Bronchitis, that man's got bronchitis, go get him. This practice originated from the belief that urine was a reflection of the body's overall health and imbalances. In some way, sure, in most ways, no. Furthermore, urine was considered to have cleansing properties and was believed to contain a substance that could combat infection and promote healing. Mmm, that good healing stuff, there we go. Brewing up that healing potion. It was used topically to clean wounds, it was used as eye drops to treat eye infections, and it was even consumed orally for various ailments. However, it is crucial to note that the use of urine as a medical treatment in ancient times, or any of those times, was not based on scientific understanding or evidence whatsoever. They were just putting pee in their eyes and just hoping for the best. Number five, moles migraines. The use of dead moles as a remedy for migraines was based on certain folk belief and traditions. Now, it was believed that the properties of a dead mole could help alleviate the pain with your migraine. Somehow, in some way, shape, or form. We're just gonna grind up a mole and see what happens. What method involved doing such? One method, you had to dry the mole and then grind it into a fine powder. This powder was then either consumed orally or mixed with water. It's like the worst crystal light ever. You'd be shaking that for hours hours before it looks good. Or this powder was applied topically to your temple or your forehead. Just dead mole rat powder, it smells great. It was thought that the potent energy or the mystical qualities possessed by the mole would be transferred to this individual, providing relief from migraines. However, do I have to say it anymore? No, it didn't work. The use of dead moles as treatment for migraines lacks scientific evidence and it's not supported at all today. Because yeah, imagine rolling up to the doctors and he starts grinding up a mole rat. He's like, what is it today? Your foot? Is your foot hurting? No problem, we'll get you all sorted out. Number four, medieval dung. 
talked about number one, now we gotta talk about number two. That's the order it comes in. In medieval times, dung, animal feces, was occasionally used as an ingredient for these treatments. I know, where is he gonna put it this time? This practice may seem a little odd to us today, but hear me out, it had some legs back then. Had some prevailing medical theories and limited understanding, but it was something. Dung, poop, animal poop, was believed to possess these medical properties such as its supposed ability to draw out toxins, stimulate healing, or serve as a topical antiseptic. It was used in various forms, most commonly in ointment, and was applied to wounds, ulcers, skin conditions, you name it, man, get creative. Whatever hurts, put some poop on it. Yeah, welcome to these times. Animal dung, such as, you know, the dung from cows or pigeons, it was commonly used due to its availability. Yeah, you thought urine was bad, but it gets worse. Pigeon poop for your elbow? I'm like, I don't know, man. This doesn't seem very good. Number three, mercury. Mercury, yeah, the element. Let's do this. In ancient times, mercury was used as a medicine due to its perceived healing properties. Now, this was an element, okay? It's not poo, it's not pee, it's something. It's something legit in the scientific community. It was believed to have a range of therapeutic effects, including treating infections, skin conditions, and even mental disorders. All that in a drop of mercury. How lucky are you? Mercury was applied topically or ingested orally, so terrible, with the idea that it could purify the body and balance your humors and promote overall well-being <laughs> with the element mercury, of course. However, the use of mercury in ancient medicine was based on horrible, incomplete knowledge and its toxicity was not fully understood at the time. Yeah, don't eat that. Don't put that anywhere near you. Prolonged exposure to mercury often results in severe health complications, including neurological damage. So if you have a headache, don't go back in time. That's pretty much it. Trepanation. Ancient trepanation, also known as trephination. You want to be all fancy, throw that the fancy pH in there. It was a surgical procedure in which a hole was drilled or scalped into the skull. Now this practice dates back thousands and thousands of years and it was performed in various ancient cultures for some reason. It was believed to serve different purposes, including relieving headaches, treating skull fractures, well, creating one, or my personal favorite, releasing evil spirits. Evil spirits, yes, finally, be gone. Trepanation was performed using crude tools and horrible techniques, often without anesthesia. So you'd be awake to feel most of it, at least. The motivations behind trepanation in ancient times remained a subject of debate, encompassing medical, religious, and cultural factors. And also, Saw 3. I think it's a little bit of Saw 3 in that one, for sure. That's terrifying. And finally, number one, it's all in your head. In the ancient Babylonian world, illnesses were commonly connected to, you guessed it, supernatural forces. Yep, next time you get a sore throat, it's the devil, nothing else. Malevolent spirits or divine retribution, all because you're sick. As a result, the role of Babylonian healers resembled that of priests and exorcists more than modern physicians, which is so silly. The treatments incorporated elements of magic and ritualistic practices. For instance, if a patient exhibited teeth grinding, this healer would interpret that as a sign of a deceased family member attempting to communicate to them during sleep. So in turn, they're Mm, they're, drawing, you know, they're trying to talk back, I guess. Drawing from ancient necromantic texts, the healer would prescribe a peculiar remedy. The patient was then advised to sleep next to a human skull for an entire week. To ensure the effectiveness of this unsettling treatment, the tooth grinder, this mm, Mr. Talky Talk, he was instructed to kiss and lick the skull seven times every night. Which, I mean, first of all, terrible for your sleep. You're not gonna get a wink with that schedule. But also disgusting. Whose head is this? I have so many questions. Why? This is a fetish. This isn't a a, a practice? These rituals demonstrate the intricate blend of spiritual beliefs and medical practices that characterize Babylonian healthcare. Growing up, I had a humidifier, so almost the same thing, kind of the same as a human skull. Kicking off the list at number 10, dirty beds. Okay, so far on this disgusting series, I can't believe we're on part seven, but we've talked about storing chamber pots under your bed. Pretty yuck, that's if you were lucky enough to have a bed, of course. If you were rich in the 1400s, having a bedroom was the talk of the town. You would have guests over to hang out in your bedroom. That was like the place to be. Social gatherings in your bedroom. That's my worst nightmare. A couple of nights talking about noble deeds. Meanwhile, you're all tucked in with your ass out, hair all messy, half asleep. Like, huh? Who is it? Most of the time in the 14th century, your mattress wasn't even a mattress. It was just a pile of straw. It was horrible. You had to sleep in your clothes, the same tunic and cloak you've worn all day, remind you, because you'll freeze at night otherwise, right? Because you're basically outside. These barns, this old wooden, not great. Also, these beds weren't in your rooms or anything. They were just like tucked in a corner. You didn't have social gatherings around the sack of straw. You know what I mean? Your bed was more often than not riddled with bird poop as well. You weren't alone in these cold rooms. You know, birds hiding up above. Also, spiders. I don't even want to know. I don't even want to dive into that. Let's move on. Number nine, mouthwash. 
Ancient Romans would use urine as mouthwash. I believe we've mentioned that before on this, again, disgusting series. It's always a fun fact to bring up at a house party next time you're drinking some Mountain Dew. Just be like, oh, did you know? The ammonia in urine was thought to ideally wash away the yuck. You just gotta get past the whole urine part, I guess. Doctors hate this one trick. Mm. Nero would tax the trade of imported bottled urine. That's how popular it was at this point. Some poor soul with a clipboard would have to stand all day and just be like, yep. In the 12th century, St. Hildegard von Bingen would advise all to wash their mouth with cold water to remove bacteria. Yeah, if only it was that easy, okay? Just one quick sh and spit it out and then you're good? No. I wish it was that easy, pal. Tortoise blood was also used once as mouthwash alongside goat milk and vinegar. Out of those three options, imagine not picking goat's milk. You're like, hmm, but what year is the tortoise blood? Number eight, Kuru. I'm not gonna lie to you. I was I was debating putting this one on the list because it has an explanation as some of them do on this list, but it still has no cure, sort of. Kuru is a very strange, fatal brain disease similar to mad cow. Proteins called prions cause a buildup of abnormal brain tissue. This causes irreversible brain damage and there's just no going back. It's 100% lethal. It was first discovered in a remote region of New Guinea by a tribe that practiced consuming human flesh. Their belief was that it preserved the spirits of the dead. This little fact brings me to my next point, that Kuru can only be contracted through the consumption of human brains. The tradition to consume human bodies is now outlawed, so there have been significantly less cases. However, there remains no cure to the disease besides, like, you know, not having human brains for Sunday dinner. Number seven, microcephaly. Microcephaly is a birth defect that affects every one in 800 to 5,000 babies born. There is no way to predict the condition unless diagnosed in the third trimester via ultrasound, but even by then, it's already too late. Even with that, the cause and treatment of the condition still remains unknown. Microcephaly is a condition in which a child's head doesn't form properly, being a few times smaller than it should be. In the womb, a baby's head grows because the brain grows. So if the brain doesn't grow, then neither does the head. Severe cases where the head is even even smaller could have resulted from injury in the womb. Accompanying conditions are seizures, developmental delay, movement and balance issues, hearing loss, difficulty swallowing, and vision problems. The list of theories as to how it happens is pretty long from genetic shifts to accidents, malnutrition, alcohol, and more. But it remains a lifelong condition with no set protocols or practices as to how to treat it, even beyond a cure. So doctors still remain baffled and there's no way of preventing it. Number six, tree man syndrome. Epidermodysplasia variciformis. That is the actual scientific name. In a previous video, we talked about stone man syndrome. Well, this next one turns you into a living human tree. Kind of. It is shocking to look at and almost looks too remarkable to be true, but sadly it is. EV is a rare inherited form of HPV, the human papillomavirus. It causes a chronic infection of bark-like growths on the skin, and they just get insane. They usually develop on the hands and feet, but have been known to develop on the face in severe cases. Currently, there are no effective treatments besides removing the warts, but nothing can stop them from growing. A man in Jerusalem hadn't been able to use his hands for years until a doctor was finally able to successfully surgically remove them. But still, there is no cure for halting the process altogether, but hopefully the cure will follow the same one that is for HPV, which is hopefully closer than we think it is. Number five, the boy who never slept. Putting your child down for a nap is probably one of the most like relieving parts as a parent. Yes, parenthood is a joy, but it's damn exhausting. I do not know how my mom and dad did it, honestly. But imagine having a four year old who like never slept. Ever. That's exactly what happened to Rhett Lamb, a young boy who boggled scientists. The mother was sure something was wrong as soon as he was born, and after realizing she wasn't just like an anxious mom, theories started flying. After multiple tireless testing, finally, they had an answer to the mystery. So yes, technically it's solved. I know that, but it's it was still a mystery, and it was unsolved for a period of time. Sue me, it's, it's really interesting. Rhett had an extremely rare condition called Chiari malformation, meaning the brain was literally being squeezed into the upper part of the spine. After undergoing surgery to remove the bone around his spinal column, doctors expected the results to set in a year later. There was a 50-50 chance that his sleep was going to improve, and it did! So I know, I know, I know. 
okay? But it's this this was like an episode of House. It starts out a mystery and then they solve it. Number four, Wim Hof, aka the Iceman. Anyone who has experienced a Canadian winter wishes they had this guy's problem. Though it doesn't really sound like a problem at all, but definitely a mystery. Wim Hof isn't bothered by the cold. That's right, the cold never bothered him anyway. Over 30 years ago, Wim Hof from the Netherlands was going for a walk when he had the overwhelming impulse to see if he could like swim in icy water and how it was. It made him feel so good that he's done it every day since. He has since been called the Iceman, his ability to withstand the cold superhuman. In January 1999, he traveled to the Arctic Circle to run a half marathon in his bare feet. Three years later, he earned the Guinness Book of World Record for the longest amount of time under the ice, twice the length of an Olympic pool. Insane. He even climbed Mount Kilimanjaro in shorts. When Dr. Ken Kamler heard of his case, he immediately began to study him. Kamler had treated dozens of people who tried and failed to climb Mount Kilimanjaro due to the extreme cold. The only explanation he's uncovered is that it must be something to do with his mindset or the wiring in his brain. This man defies science in ways that no one quite understands. And if you want to learn more, you can check out his website. Number three, Perry's Romberg syndrome. Another unbelievably rare and terrifying disorder where the skin and soft tissues of half of the face atrophy. It usually occurs in the left half of the face and is more common in women than in men. The deterioration begins above the upper jaw, between the nose and the upper lip, then to the eye, ear, and neck areas. This process may also affect the gums and roof of the mouth. So essentially, the left side of your face caves in on itself and ages 80 years. Hair on that side turns white and falls out. This entire process takes place over a two to 10 year period before it finally stabilizes. Sometimes it hinders vision, other times the effects are just cosmetic, but still a frustrating process for the patients going through it. On top of that, there is no cure and there are no current treatments to stop the deterioration. So far, the only option is surgical intervention with reconstructive procedures. Number two, RPI deficiency. Introducing the second rarest disease in the world, fitting for number two, with only four known cases ever historically diagnosed. White matter is made up of tissue that includes nerve fibers that connect nerve cells. So, needless to say, one of the most important parts of the brain. RPI deficiency patients have diffuse white matter abnormalities, which causes psychomotor regression, developmental delays, along with seizures, poor vision, and slow emotional and physical reflexes. Scientists are working tirelessly to find a way to cure it. But you might be thinking, if it's so rare, why are we so stressed about it? Well, you might think that with your perfectly healthy brain, but to the next potential patient, a cure could mean the world. Well, actually, no, it will mean the world. Though doctors have been able to figure out the cause, the cure still remains unsolved. Number one, Fields disease. Fields disease was named after a pair of twins in Wales, Catherine and Christy, who were the first to be diagnosed with the disease, and they're the only ones. In total, there have only been two diagnosed cases of the disease in history, which makes it like the rarest in the world. What is it exactly? Fields disease is a neuromuscular disease that affects the voluntary movement of muscles. Due to the rarity of the case, information is very, very limited. Doctors first noticed it when the girls were about four years old, and by the time they turned nine, they could barely walk. By age 11, they couldn't eat or write by themselves, and by 14, they lost the ability to speak. So as you can see, the degeneration is quite rapid. Alongside losing their ability to move and function, Catherine and Christy also experienced over 100 painful, muscle spasms daily. The doctors did numerous tests to rule out other conditions, but still they have no idea what is causing the disease. Nor, of course, is there a cure. While they work to find one, the best they can do is make sure the girls are comfortable to the best of their ability. Otherwise, Fields disease remains a mystery, but hopefully, Hopefully, not for much longer. Number 10, chloroform for asthma. Yeah, chloroform, like the see ya, that kind of stuff. In the past, chloroform was occasionally used as a treatment for asthma, believe it or not, albeit with limited understandings of its potential risks and side effects, of course, as are all of these. The rationale behind this practice stemmed from the belief that asthma was caused by excessive bronchial spasm or nervous irritability. Now, it was thought that chloroform at the time, with its sedative and calming properties, calming properties, properties could relax the bronchial muscles and alleviate the symptoms of asthma attacks. On paper, sure, sounds maybe doable, 
Scientifically, we're like, no, never, don't do that at all, please God. Chloroform, a volatile liquid with anesthetic properties, was administered through inhalation. Patients would inhale the vapor, which was believed to have a soothing effect on the respiratory system, sure, providing temporary relief from the constriction and wheezing associated with asthma. Chloroform is a potent and toxic substance, known to depress the central nervous system and cause respiratory depression when administered in excessive amounts. Oh, additionally, it carries the risk of addiction and long-term health complications. So, no, not a great start on this list today. Number nine, flowers for cataracts. In traditional medicine, periwinkle flowers were sometimes used as a treatment for cataracts. Cataracts, a condition characterized by the clouding of lens in the eye, shout out to my brother Kyle, he's blind as sh Periwinkle flowers contain alkaloids such as vincamine and vincristine, which are known to have pharmacological effects on the circulatory system. I sound like Bill Nye. It was believed that these compounds could enhance blood circulation to the eyes, potentially improving vision and slowing down the progress of these cataracts. People would prepare infusions or extracts from the flowers and then apply them topically or consume them orally in the hopes, again, mostly hopes here, that their vision problems would go away or something would alleviate. However, it's important to note that the efficiency of periwinkle flowers in treating cataracts has not been scientifically proven at all. Eating flowers is not gonna help your eye. Of course not. You know what I mean? Cataracts are a complex condition with various underlying causes, and their treatment typically requires surgery or corrective lenses. Not a couple flower petals. That's not, what is this? No, definitely not. Number eight, Morgellons disease. This next one is a more controversial disease. Morgellons disease is an unexplained condition where a patient believes that there is something crawling beneath their skin. As a result, scabs and irritation erupt from persistent scratching along with small fibers. It is controversial because the research done on the condition has yielded conflicting results. Some doctors think it is a result of a delusional infestation, while others believe it is an infectious process in the skin cells. The Center for Disease Control yielded a study that concluded it isn't caused by an infection. However, multiple studies have reported a possible link between Morgellons and another bacterial infection. To this day though, there is still no proven treatment or confirmed understanding of the disease, so for now, it remains a medical mystery. Number seven, Landon Jones. It is rare for anyone to be able to resist the French fry. Everyone has that friend that says, no, I don't want McDonald's, like I don't want any. And then you order some and they always are just like, at your french fries and you're like, get out of here, those are mine. Anyways, that would be me. Well, Landon Jones may be the only person who would be able to resist. On October 14, 2013, the preteen Landon Jones woke up with a bacterial infection in his left lung, which was treated successfully, or so they thought. Landon lost his appetite entirely. This boy is literally never hungry. His parents have to bargain with him to eat, but unfortunately he keeps losing weight. After visiting specialist after specialist, the only thing doctors have been able to determine is that Landon may be the only one of his kind, which doesn't make it very helpful. There are no other cases like this in the world. Landon did start having absent seizures three years prior, which could provide some hint as to what is going on. The leading explanation is that it is a rare condition that affects the hypothalamus, the tiny area of the brain that controls hunger, thirst, blood pressure, and sleep. I wasn't able to find any recent articles referring to his progress now, but I hope, Landon, that wherever you are, that you are doing much better. Number six, a water allergy. A human being can only survive without water for around three days, so this medical condition is definitely surprising. How can we be allergic to something we need to survive? The condition, while still a mystery, has a name, aquagenic urticaria, and affects less than 100 people across the world. Whenever someone with this condition comes in contact with water, they break out in hives and rashes that last around an hour. And researchers have no idea what the underlying cause is. The leading theory is that it is caused by allergens in the water, so patients are encouraged to drink purified water or bathe in purified water as well. But beyond that, they have no clue. Due to the rarity of the condition, there is very little data to study, but I think we can all be grateful it isn't common either. Number five, Mandy Sellers. When Mandy was born, she appeared to be a healthy child until she started growing. Despite having a very lean frame, Mandy's legs alone weigh 200 pounds five times the normal size. She was a medical mystery doctors had no idea how to solve. The only way they could foresee stopping the growth of her legs was amputation. This procedure eventually happened in 2010 when she developed an infection. Even stranger though, this didn't stop the condition at all as the leg started growing back. 
Imagine how frustrating that would be. Fortunately though, according to Mandy's website, she was able to go on an experimental new drug that helped to shrink her legs. Then finally, after years of suffering, she was able to be officially diagnosed. Mandy's condition is the result of a mutation of the PIK3CA gene, the only one of its kind, something she's pretty proud of. Still, doctors have yet to come up with a more effective treatment as of 2019. She is still waiting for a new drug trial and her legs appear to be kind of plateauing. So who knows where she's at now, but Mandy, I hope you're doing better. Number four, spontaneous accent. What do you mean? Not everybody does that on this channel. Um, anyways, shut up, Rachel. God. Imagine waking up one morning and finally having the accent you've always wanted. I'm sure there is someone out there who wishes for that. But Rosemary Dorr wasn't one of them. Southern Ontario based Rosemary Dorr immediately rushed to the hospital in 2006 after sensing signs of a stroke. She ended up spending most of that summer in post stroke care, but what was very strange was her recovery. Rosemary took on an entirely new accent. Her Southern Ontario dialect became that of Newfoundland. And if you live in Canada, you know how different those accents are. She couldn't shake it. Rosemary was suffering from a real condition called foreign accent syndrome. It's a thing. Only 60 other cases have ever been confirmed worldwide. The first known was a Norwegian woman during World War II who started speaking with a German accent after a head injury. Very, very poor timing. The exact cause is still unknown, but you know, Hopefully Rosemary's learned to live with that. It's a pretty fun accent. Number three, the girl who cries stone. From a magic spell to a witch's curse, this little girl from Yemen shocked doctors and mystics with her strange ability. Sadia started literally crying stones since she was eight years old and no one can sort out why. Her father was desperate to find a treatment and despite many x-rays in local clinics, nothing out of the ordinary was spotted. Most of the stones came out in the afternoon, weirdly enough, and she can produce as many as a hundred in a single day. Thankfully, they do not hurt her and for the most part, her life is normal. Since her case, one other woman in Bajal experienced similar symptoms, except this time they were accompanied by bouts of unconsciousness and a swollen abdomen. She has since been treated and recovered fully, but as to what is wrong with Sadia, no one is quite sure. Number two, Brooke Greenberg. Sadly, Brooke passed away at the young age of 20 before she ever found the explanation for her condition. However, there is a chance that she might never have been aware of it. Brooke's body refused to age and at the time of her death, she had never learned to speak and had the mental capacity of a toddler and remained the size of a baby. As an actual baby, her survival was considered a miracle in itself as she endured a stroke and several stomach ulcers. She also mysteriously had a brain tumor that put her into a deep sleep for two weeks. Then it disappeared and she woke up. Kinda weird, right? By age 16, she hadn't lost her baby teeth, though her bones had appeared to have aged, just not grown. Her case was enough to bring retired medical expert Richard F. Walker back to the field. In fact, he has made it his life's work to uncover what caused her condition. Her case has since been labeled Syndrome X and he continues to study similar patients. He believes that if they solve it, they will not only help these people, but perhaps discover the key to the fountain of youth. And last but not least, a superhuman memory. If I were to have a superpower, I would either want teleportation or superhuman intelligence. I think about that every single day. So the mysterious condition that Jill Price has has me like green with envy. God, oh, what, what, what I would do, how many, the books I would read. Ugh. Jill can name every single detail of every day she's ever lived. Give her a date and she could tell you everything she did with ease from like how many stirs she stirred her coffee with to like what she read that morning, every single thing. Her condition is called HSAM, highly autobiographical memory. And why people like her seem to have this superhuman ability is a complete mystery. Brain images have depicted differences in the structure of their brains to muggles like us, but it can't be confirmed as to whether it is these brain differences that cause the condition. Man, but if they could patent that into like a super juice or a kind of coffee, I would, I'd be so happy. I'd be, I'd be just very, very excited about that because good God, 
dreams to life, you know what I mean? Number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of more about personal hygiene now than we did, you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys, it's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's, that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth. But this, that it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst. You gotta get up, walk down that long, scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up, oh, oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes if you're feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history, you're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, the all in one. All right, man, this one goes out to us. The manly men, the dads, the sons, the brothers. The men who work all day and night and still have time for their family. I appreciate you and I see you, brother. Want to know why we have so much time, ladies? Well, that's because we've cut back on time in the shower with a very five-head invention. We call it body wash or face wash or shampoo because we use it for everything, three in one. Yes, that's right. If we buy a body wash product, that means it will be used all over our bodies. No time for L'Oreal Pantene or that purple shampoo with the kangaroo. We speed run shower so we can get back into doing the things that you ladies love, like not putting the toilet seat down. Number seven, king of the porcelain throne. Kings, I hear you. Life can be busy and the shower speed run is not the only product that we've invented. Here's another shout out to all my kings who take extra time while sitting upon the porcelain throne. I salute you. Yes, that's right. Besides doing the hygienic process of evacuating one's bowels, we take a mental health break in the bathroom. A time to check in, relax, take inventory, and take a breath of some not so fresh air. Especially if you ate Taco Bell the night before. Is it strange to sit there in that situation? Perhaps. But like any other guru, we need a space to feel our spirituality. Would Yoda be Yoda if he didn't meditate? Mmm, sit on the toilet, I will. Number six, the beard apron. This is just so smart and I'm seriously considering buying one because this is the bane of my existence. Sometimes the lumberjack look is too much for me and the closer I get to looking like Chris Farley, the better. I think I have a great motivational speaker impression. Maybe I'll show you guys one day. We'll see. I don't know. However, when shaving my beard, I have nowhere to go and it's too cold in the winter to do it outside. So. That's why this is so smart. Basically, it's an apron that you post up like a hammock. So when you're shaving down those chiseled cheekbones of yours, all the little hairs fall into the apron. That way your GF can't yell at you because there's no mess to be made. Necessity truly is the mother of all invention. Number five, bacon products. Who doesn't love bacon, right? Bacon is delicious. Bacon is a delicious meat that can be enjoyed for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Personally, there was nothing like waking up on a Saturday morning as a kid to play some GameCube and eat bacon and eggs, my favorite. I was a tubby kid and I was easy to impress. However, while bacon may not be the king of the breakfast table, it is the bootleg flavor of fragrance and the non-food market. It seems every time there's a store, gift shop, or novelties being sold, a bacon flavored, scented, or themed product is there for men. And it's not far behind. Because yes, we are tough and rugged. And we eat meat because we're cowboys. So that also means we want breath mints that are artificially bacon flavored, right? No, we don't. They taste horrible. It's awful. No one wants that. Nobody wants that. Number four, bath bomb. 
Call it genius marketing, crazy society, or people wasting money, but a lot of hygiene beauty products that women purchase, men do too. They just gotta repackage it and inject it with 300 cc's of testosterone because men. Take the hand grenade bath bomb for instance, taking bath bomb to a whole other level. Yes, the one I saw while researching was very colorful and it looked like it had a fruity scent, but it was shaped like a hand grenade from the second world war. No way an adult man would fall for that, right? Pfft, no! Chris, you see my rubber ducky? Number 3, the man bun. Honestly, I don't mind this trend, I actually think it looks good. Certainly better than the mullets of the 90s. There's no way you can tell me mullets look better than man buns. You just can't. The man buns are actually somewhat organized. Especially if dudes grow them out and maintain them. However, what is strange to me is the man bun add-on. Yeah, it's like a man bun extension. You just it's like, a, like a clip on. Basically, look like the guy who plays Wonderwall at every party for the low, low price of $19.99. I can't be dissing too much though, because I wore a clip-on tie to the ninth grade. But the girls thought I was cute? I think? I think so? Number two, gendered products. Another broad stroke here, but when things get placed in the categories, there's always two colors that get used. Pink for girls, blue for boys. While I'm not sure whether colors are actually masculine or feminine themselves, it has been hardwired into most of us, that's just how it goes. Anything plastered in blue or male-like imagery, it's what's meant for men. I, however, as a kid had an absolute five-head play. To protect my valuables from thieves and villains in the night, I always chose something that was girl themed, pink, or something a boy wouldn't pick. As I thought if presented with my stolen items, I could always identify them since only a boy would choose girly stuff. From my Nintendo DS to my notebooks and honestly everything in between. I, Hot Pink was in and Chetty made it work. I thought the plan was foolproof. I, I never really thought though what would happen if a girl took my stuff though. That, that, that didn't, I didn't really think that wouldn't work for that, would it? No, it wouldn't. Number one, wine in a can. This one is just so silly to me and for any wine connoisseurs out there, take this with a grain of salt. I'm no sommelier, but I enjoyed the odd glass of wine, even if it comes from a box. I always thought the wine glass was elegant, higher class, but that doesn't mean you have to be higher class to drink it, or be less masculine. Well, now there's wine in a can for men, because we can't have flimsy glasses, we'll break those glasses because we're so strong, oh yeah. I just can't imagine wine in a can tasting good, it has to be worse than wine in a box, right? Uh, let me know in the comments guys, I'm curious, what do you like to drink? Let Chetty know, I'm, I'm curious, I'd love to hear. Kicking off the list at number 10, wiper no wiping. On part three of the series, we of course brought up the worst job in royal history, the groom of the stool. Wiping was a royalty, we didn't have the fluffy bear family telling us to hashtag enjoy the go where they used an incredible amount, just a wasteful amount of toilet paper, those bears, so wasteful. We had to improvise back then and use leaves. And by we, I mean medieval peasants, not us. We discussed Romans just pooping through cold cement benches, but what did they use to wipe after the fact? Well, that was the sponge on the stick method, which I'll be honest, that's my favorite of the ancient methods. Cause you know somebody had the perfect stick, right? Like one that was like, hm, hm, just the perfect angle to really get in there. No, the sponge on the stick wasn't that fun at all. It was actually communal, it was all bad. You had to share it, be like, oh, okay. Here you go, sir. Early Americans used brickline pits, and that was their washrooms. This was around the time of the Declaration of Independence, and besides human waste, people would dump anything in these toilets. They found a window in one of these pits. A window. Some poor guy hit a window. Can you believe that? And as for wiping, are you ready? Dried corn on the cob, that's what they would use. Yeah, man, next time you do that corn on the cob butter trick where you like spin it through the butter, all nice and smooth, keep that in mind. Number nine, just pull it. We talked about brushing your teeth with urine, we've talked about using horsehair for dental floss, but can it get even more bizarre when it comes to oral cleanliness? Yes. We still do this method today. If a tooth is beyond repair or it's causing an infection in your jaw, yeah, just pull that sucker out. See ya. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes. Back in the day though, this was the best and only method. Sore tooth, maybe a cavity, something's not feeling right, maybe your gums are just hurting, maybe you bit down on a bone, no problem, pull it. No matter what the case is, just <laughs> yank it out. Dentists weren't a thing in the Middle Ages. Dr. Downer didn't politely remind you to floss more, you know what I'm saying? But they did have a barber, the fastest dentist in the game. Barbers are responsible for obviously cutting hair, but they too would pull teeth and they would bloodlet. This guy must have been in the weeds every single day. He was so busy. Yeah, just a little off the top, maybe a little bit of blood at this, a couple of molars too, classic three in one appointment, you're good, debit. If you walked into the barber shop and you were bald, he already knew what was up. He was like, all right, I'm gonna start warming up the arm here. And if you think that's weird, well, let's go a little bit more recent for this one. Number eight, 
my heroes. Let me create a scenario for you. I like creating scenarios. Let me create a scenario for you. You're on the way to a certain event that is very important in the big city. Maybe it's a new job, a new summer fling, or something that requires dry pants. But now your stomach is acting up. It's big angy. Your stomach's making sounds that are becoming more audible and you can feel soon you will require a bathroom. But you hold it in. I can make it past this event and then go, you say to yourself, no problem. But now you've got cramps, sweats, and you're getting anxious as you know that DEF CON 1 is approaching. You now have to make a decision to make a rush to find a bathroom or be late for your event or take a gamble with your underwear and dignity. Yes, that is a feeling I know all too well, but perhaps I should have been living in the Aztec Empire as they had public washrooms all over the city. That's just awesome. Oh, what sweet relief. As if that weren't the most unusual, they also had citizens cleaning the streets, which is pretty unusual for the time. Yes, cleanliness was very important to the Aztecs, and honestly, I think there should be public toilets on every street corner. Please, sometimes I gotta go. Number seven, thirsty. After a trip to the public washrooms, you may need a drink of water to rehydrate yourself. I mean, come on. I know I could use some hydration after that. Sometimes it gets really sweaty in there. Well, it's a good thing that the Aztec cities had canals. And not just the kind of canals a small Italian gentleman derives a boat through on Valentine's Day, but canals that handled both transportation and irrigation. Aztecs knew just how important water was for life, but perhaps most unusual about the Aztecs is their night soil collectors, which honestly sounds like it's hiding something just in that name. Night soil. Basically, they were beta garbage collectors who used canoes to transport this night soil to farms for fertilizer. And yes, night soil is exactly what you think it is. Poop! But it's unusual for a civilization to be so conscious of where their waste goes. Don't believe me? Well, how about this summer? We all get together, we all go up to New York City and take a dip in the Hudson River. Yeah, not many takers, didn't think so. They were doing their best with what they had. And if women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. You know what I'm saying? Number six, ye olde dentistry. Look, every time I find a decent dentistry fact, I slap that bad boy in here like a D-based infomercial host with a surprisingly effective kitchen gadget. You're gonna love my nuts, remember that guy? This is just one of those facts. Do I have a fear of the dentist? No. No, I don't, because my dentist is nice and has all the modern amenities to make me feel at ease. A comfy chair, laughing gas, and putting Peppa Pig on the TV because I'm a big baby. Goo goo gaga. However, no amount of any of those things I mentioned can prepare you for the dentistry before the year 1900. It was crude to say the least, but hygiene is hygiene, and you gotta keep that mouth fresh and clean. Tooth infections were fixed with rubbing charcoal in the affected area, and if that wasn't enough, a super safe mixture of snake venom and vinegar was used. What? I, okay. Who was the first guy that discovered snake venom had such healing properties? Probably the same weirdo who first milked a cow, if I had to guess. Aztec dentistry included fillings and tooth removal as well. Also, ladies of the evening dyeing their teeth distinct colors, so then you know if you know. You know? Look at my red teeth, boys. Number five, steam baths. Now looking back and learning that the Aztecs had public washrooms everywhere and had access to steam baths because of their irrigation is fantastic. I mean, come on, just think about it. You could relax after a long day in your own steam bath that's made by natural running water. It sounds like doing yoga there would make me feel more in touch with my inner chakras. And my mood crystals would glow just a little bit brighter. Imagine, you walk into a bathhouse after a long day, and then you see me just sitting there with a towel that barely fits. Well, hey there, good looking. Why don't you come on in and pop a squat next to me? I promise I don't hog all the steam. I know it sounds like an amazing time, right? The more we talk about the Aztecs, the more they sound like a perfect society. I wonder what happened to them. I'm sure it was nothing bad. They gotta be out there somewhere. Move over, fellas, I'm coming in for the steam. The steam was thought to have healing properties and was connected to their spirituality. Women even gave birth in the steam rooms, which feels like a really sweaty time. I just, I don't know about that. There's a lot of sweat. Number four, Bath and Body Works. It's clear the Aztecs were just cleaner than the other civilizations of the past, and honestly, I'm here for it. There's only so much a guy can say about people being stinky in the past. I mean, really, the smell must have been horrible. 
especially down in the nether regions. My lady, I would like to have a child with you, but the fragrance that is coming from both of our undercarriages makes me want to get into my carriage and drive it into the nearest body of water. Yes. Aztecs were making soap like it was their day job, using various herbs and plants to create much nicer smells and perfumes. However, during the rainy months, Aztecs wouldn't wash or wash their clothes in penance. But I guess one month isn't so bad. Strangely enough, women wouldn't wash their faces when men went off to war. I'm not sure about that one, but hey, I'll take it. Gold star for staying clean, Aztecs. Gold star. Number three, Bath and Body Works Part Two. Okay, another scenario. You're in the sixth grade. You're sitting at a desk and listening to Mrs. Smith, and she's going over what today's art assignment is. As you begin to reach for your favorite shade of red crayon, an odor hits your nose. It's unlike anything you've ever smelled before, and it's coming from your armpit. Puberty induced body odor. Not to worry. Your buddy has a can of the finest spray deodorant there is. He hands you a black can that says Axe. You are now one of them. And you start showing up to school dances with a seafoam pink button up shirt with the collar popped and a Justin Bieber haircut with the hat on backwards. Yeah, that's right. All while drenched in a can of Axe's finest. Shark tooth necklace shows every girl in the room that you're a tough guy. God, those guys are the worst. Okay, no, the Aztecs didn't go that far, but they were aware of the horrors of the classroom BO and recommended a special bath prepared with lovely smelling aromas, which makes sense. Good smells go in, bad smells from your bum, they go out. However, there's two ingredients that make me question things. Apparently, no odor killing bath is complete without a fresh bone from a dog and a human. I'm just gonna leave that with you and think about how you'd feel with two bones floating in your bath. That's disgusting. Apparently, they had to be fresh, too. That's gross. Number two, the Aztec classic. I'm glad the Aztecs had better hygiene, because for once, I don't get super queasy talking about the things people did. However, it wouldn't be a video about Aztecs if I didn't talk about their favorite pastime. Sacrifice. And honey, if they were given out gold medals for it, the Aztecs would be record breakers. Sure, they weren't the only civilization to sacrifice people, but they did it with such theatrics. It would make my old theater teacher very proud. But unlike most civilizations, the Aztecs did this all the time. Whenever the calendar called for one, it was time for one. And if they ran out of people, they would go grocery shopping for more. Or actually just go to war and take people, which is not good. Just know that when a chief or a religious leader cuts the heart out of a man whilst alive for the entire city to see, he most likely had a clean cloth and water to wash his hands, making modern surgeons proud everywhere. Number one, the European bug. It's safe to say that Aztecs, while not as clean as people today, they were striving for better hygiene, more than any other civilization at the time, really. However, no amount of hand washing, sacrificing, or putting herbs in your bath can prepare them for the Spanish. Not just the swords and the guns and invading and such, no, I mean the sickness that Europeans brought with them. It's a plot similar to War of the Worlds, except the invaders brought all the nasties with them. No matter what the Aztecs did, it wasn't going to stop the waves of lovely things the Europeans brought over. Armpits are clean, but now they got black lungs. There's too many diseases to even name, there's a lot. Kicking off the list at number 10, pig toilets. Yeah, we'll start off with a nasty one. Look, we're on the part six now. We're talking about some ancient hygiene practices. It's gonna get gross, it just has to at this point. I've talked about Roman toilets, horsehair dental floss. So now we gotta dive into some yucky stuff. Pig toilets began around 200 BC in China and these pig toilets were actually pretty common. You would just go to the washroom over top of a pig pen. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty awful, but also it's all they had. It's pretty awful, but I would say it's worse for the pig. Pigs, definitely worse for the pigs. The pigs would eat the waste because it was mixed into their food. They couldn't tell the difference. Ugh, horrible. This was one of the few options to manage waste, especially in areas where plumbing wasn't possible. I talked about pigs going to court in your recent Bumblebee video. If I was a pig, I would be pressing charges left, right, and center after this. That's so disgusting. We're at number 10 and I want to puke. Nice, buckle up. Number nine, water closets. This one sounds fun. A closet full of water. What a blast, pun intended. Back in the 1800s, all over Europe, our modern day version of the bathroom came to life. Thankfully, I'm, I'm very glad this happened. If it didn't happen, it'd be, it'd be a little bit different nowadays. It takes two things to have a water closet. A home big enough for a room purely devoted to waste, which is amazing. And of course, running water, that definitely helps. Sir John Harrington, godson to Queen Elizabeth I, was determined to invent what we now know as the basic toilet. Back in 1596, he created this idea, and people actually made fun of this guy for spending so much time working on a useless device. Yeah. 
the more we know. Cut to 200 years later, another inventor by the name of Alexander Cummings reworked the water closet, added an S trap, the little valve between the top and the bottom parts of the bowl, and now we're on the right track. Then a couple years later, in 1777, Samuel Prosser applied for a plunger closet patent and got it. A year later after that, Joseph Brama enters the toilet game, adds a valve on the bottom, an old school ball cock. So we're getting there, slowly over time. Different inventors are bringing their new ideas in, all so that we can go and take a Brotman was a sailor at the time, so his water closet was often used on ships of that era. Today we have toilets that flush automatically. Once you get up or move around, the sensors think you're done, and then they blast away. If you stand and wipe, good game. This thing's gonna be making noise all day long. We talked about one type of head hair. Let's travel down to the other, bearded baddies. Recently, beards have made a huge comeback, especially now among the young generations thanks to throwback fashion. And studies have shown that people also associate a man with a beard as being more intelligent, and many people find them to be incredibly attractive. Also, nothing is cooler than the giant dude with the bald head and like the big ass beard, you know, let's be real. Respect for beards though is nothing new. During medieval times, knights were known to grow their beards as a sign of honor, and if one man touched another man's sign of honor, well, it was enough of an insult to challenge them to a duel to the death. Now, shaving was common during the Middle Ages. Commoners would be clean shaven for the most part. Royalty was also usually shaven or had a very trim beard that was kept neat and tidy. Hilariously, however, this is kind of how barbers get started. Back in medieval times, mirrors were very small and cloudy, so they're not reliable. They were also only available to the upper class. On top of that, razors as we know them today didn't exist, so if you want to shave, you need to use one of those dangerously long razor blades. So most folks would visit the local barber surgeon for a Sweeney Todd style lineup. As we mentioned earlier, monks had shaved heads and no beards, so they took turns shaving one another as a community. And speaking of faces, the Dark Ages were surprisingly skincare obsessed. Vikings are remembered as some of the most hygienic of historical people, and they were reported to have the best practices of personal hygiene in the early Middle Ages especially. Most notable was the near daily bathing they did in the cold waters of fjords and rivers. They used combs made out of ivory or innate wood carvings, and they practiced braiding their hair for prestige and ranking. The daily practice of bathing and personal hygiene actually was what spared the king of Poland from an outbreak of plagues that had been seen in Europe. Meanwhile, in England, bathing was not as common as it is today and it was often reserved for special occasions. People would usually wash their hands and faces regularly, however. The ideal woman in the Middle Ages had that pale, smooth skin without any pockmarks or blemishes. Nearly everyone washed their face with cold water at the end of the day, even if they wouldn't wash the rest of themselves for inexplicable amounts of time. Some women used ointments made of animal fat in order to keep skin soft and smooth. And crystal girlies, even back then, people believed in the power of gemstones to heal. Women would lick amethyst and rub it over their pimples to make it go away. But rest assured, when it's bath time, you were naked in a crowd. In many Middle Age cultures, public bathing was commonplace. The Romans, Egyptians, Greeks, they were especially known for their bathhouses. And in the spring and summer, commoners could be spotted using streams and rivers to take a bath on a nice warm day. Back then, this wasn't seen as being indecent or strange. Water was scarce, and the process of heating a bath was time consuming and expensive. So, it was also common to share bath water among a lot of people and be less wasteful. However, people are still humans after all, so, like teens at a pool party, public bathing became associated with a certain level of sensuality. Seeing as this was a time period where intercourse was usually in hearing or seeing range of your imminent direct family, it's not a surprise this happened, let alone the fact nobody actually cared if it was. Well, except the church. They threw a bunch of laws around to try and limit that crap, but that's always what they've done. Anywho, in Japan, they still continue the tradition of public bathing in hot springs to this day. However, they have the option to segregate when men from women, so it's not as often that people leave the public bathhouse to hook up nowadays. Not to get you guys too excited either, but face washing brought in controversial hand washing. Contrary to popular belief, some groups of the medieval people actually wash their hands multiple times a day. Jewish people in particular made sure to wash their hands before eating, and Christians adopted the same practice. But even unreligious peoples would sometimes wash their hands after eating, since a lot of people didn't own utensils, and wiping your hands on fabric ain't always gonna do it. Case in point, honey garlic wings. In upper class families, guests specifically were always requested to wash their hands by pouring water out of a pitcher called an aquamanil, which was poured over a basin. These aquamanils were often in the shape of lawn, 
giants or people or mythical creatures. However, no one was washing to the extent of using soap for 20 seconds. The water in these small pitchers needed to be shared among a large group of people. So people in the Middle Ages simply splashed water on their hands before drying and poured the dirty water right back in to wash someone else's fingers later. But you'd think that soap would be involved, especially because endless people essentially had a dark age Etsy store. Today, soap is made out of essentially the same products every time. Back in the Middle Ages though, people used a lot of different substances in a cauldron like witches making a potion just trying to produce some semblance of soapy stuff that don't smell bad. Most successful was a combination of lime, wood ash, lard and oil. Black soap, aka soft soap, gets its name from the dark color of the wood ash lye used to make it, and the cast iron it was often boiled in. Hard soap was made with high quality barilla ashes, which creates a light colored lye. Therefore, white soap quickly became equated with high quality hard soap. The stiff soap was then molded into cakes and bars, added dried flowers to the outer side, and the quality and scent of the soap changes depending on how wealthy someone is. Unfortunately, Casey didn't catch the keyword in there a few times, folks made soap with lye, which is so harsh it can remove skin if you scrub a little too hard. Next is how the world could have had toilet paper faster if they weren't judgy wipers. China had toilet paper figured out as early as the 6th century, making small squares of rice paper that would decompose into the ground and take the feces with it. Pretty eco-friendly stuff. However, the Europeans found this to be horrifying because they thought it was disgusting that the Chinese only wiped without actually washing their backside with water. Meanwhile in Europe, they're using a communal sponge on a stick that sat in a bucket of water that wouldn't be changed all day, so please tell me which is more unsanitary and horrifying. In medieval Europe, people sometimes used devices called gonfus or a gonf stick as well as a torchicool or a torch cut. The gonf sticks were sponges on a stick as described, where the torchicool was anything to wipe the bottom. Like straw or moss or leaves or wood. You know, the basics. Who has time to care about eye bags though when you're walking around wearing a gag preventer nose bag? Even though medieval people clean their bodies a, a little bit more than you would imagine, that doesn't mean the towns were sparkling clean. When you stepped outside you came face to face with human waste, rotting food, and trash riddled streets. Horses regularly relieved themselves on the street as did the live animals in the markets and so did the people. Also animals just kind of died in places and people would leave them there. Add in the smell of mold from straw houses and the smell of diseased human or animal skin and sometimes even corpses, these bad smells were at their worst in cities and large towns. Things were so incredibly smelly people nearly gagged, especially when it all began to bake under the hot summer sun and heat. So in order to combat the smell, some people wore nose bags, which were fabric like masks that were filled with flowers and other fragrances that would be able to help the stomach smell the streets filled with waste. Men and women would their put noses in the nose bag, give them a huff, and life is good again. The lesson here, be thankful for breeze and use it. And of course, the weirdest for last, the ear spoon. Sounds promising, doesn't it? While nowadays people use q-tips to clean your ears, which apparently we aren't even supposed to be doing, as cringe worthy as it sounds, people use long wooden or metal spoons called ear spoons or ear picks to remove the wax. Ear picks were also frequently made of bone, ivory, and brass as purely utilitarian items. Archaeologists have found them amongst the Vikings primarily, where it was common for them to carry an ear spoon on a chain around their neck so that they never have to be without their little tool should they ever have to degunk themselves. Ear spoons were used by all levels of society in medieval and post medieval England following the Tudors. The 17th century English knew about plaque, which they called scale, and they were encouraged by their doctors to scrape their teeth frequently. So these little Little doodads expanded to include that purpose. And how could I not mention that while a tailor normally would use beeswax to coat thread and make it stronger and easier to use, with no bees available, earwax would do. As gross as it may seem to us today, earwax was worth saving and selling. Kicking off our list at number 10, seam squirrels. I love squirrels. Being Canadian, we see quite a bit of them. They're a little too friendly for me at times, but they're great. During the Old West era, seam squirrels were, well, not what you think. Personal hygiene was not a priority for many people back then, obviously, and lice infestations were unfortunately quite common. Now, the type of lice that affected people during this time was commonly known as body lice, which is pretty horrible. That could be found in the seams of clothing, hence the term seam squirrels. Yeah, not actually a squirrel at all. It's just body lice. Gotcha. Body lice, of course, was a major problem during the Old West era, and they were responsible for the spread of diseases like typhus, trench fever, and relapsing fever. Relapsing fever? I haven't even heard of that one. That's terrible. These diseases were often fatal because, you know, ye Old West. 
West and many people in the Old West succumbed to them. To combat the spread of lice and the, you know, one of many diseases that they carried, people in the Old West often resorted to extreme measures such as burning their clothing or even shaving their heads completely. That's why you see old cowboys and they look like they're stressed. They have no hair, their clothes are just gone. You're like, what happened? Lice, lice happened. Some people also used remedies like vinegar and kerosene to try and kill the lice, so. Yeah, it was a rough time, either way. Overall, lice infestations were a significant health concern during the Old West era, and they played a significant role in the spread of disease. Yeah, it wasn't just rats in the medieval era, it was also lice, which is even grosser, in my opinion. Number nine, Old West Dental. I could use some Old West Dental recently. I got a, I'm chewing on one side right now, you know what I mean? In the Old West, dental hygiene was not a priority for everyone. They couldn't afford it. And also, dental care was often very sparse. You couldn't really find it anywhere, for that matter. People generally didn't have access to modern dental tools or products, and many did not have regular access to any dentists at any point in their life, which is a sad but real fact. That would suck, I'm terrified. However, there were some basic dental hygiene practices that people in the Old West may have followed to keep their teeth, you know, somewhat in their heads, you know, keep their gums not rotten. Didn't do much, but did something. There were toothbrushes. Not many, but, you know, wasn't as good as Oral-B. There's some stuff. More often than not, you'd have to use twigs or chew on mint, that kind of natural survivor stuff. Some people may have also used a cloth or a rag to rub their teeth clean. Yeah, don't forget your tooth cloth before you go on vacation, I guess. You gotta and put it back in your pocket. Your old woody teeth, gotta rub those. Access to professional dental care was limited in the Old West. Some towns, some, had dentists, but all they did back then was just pull out the problem. They didn't give you a crown. They're like, which one hurts? All right, get out of here. All without anesthesia. So that's a great time. You're gonna remember all of it. Other options included a community toothbrush, which is hilarious to think about and also so sad. Yeah, some public establishments had a public toothbrush. Can you imagine? Go out, have a little brush, check your teeth. All right, cool. I'm gonna go back to the bar. I'm gonna be sick. I'm gonna actually throw up right now. Number eight, sweet traps. When you're royalty of one of the most successful empires and civilizations in human history, it means you ain't gonna lift a finger. Less than any other celebrities do today, probably. So what to do with all that extra time in your hands instead of living like everyone else? Well, how about a picnic? That sounds nice, actually. Sounds great, right? Except when we bring out all of our favorite treats. The flies and bugs bother us, and we can't look beautiful if we're covered in bugs head to toe. How did the Egyptians fix this, you ask? Well, it's simple. Don't let the bugs bite you in the first place. Basically, you get one of your forced volunteers, maybe a couple actually, and you slather the poor devils in honey till they look like your favorite pastry from Tim Hortons. Place said glazed serving away from the picnic and now you can enjoy it in sunshine and peace. The screaming of being eaten alive by bugs might dampen the mood, so just, just wear earplugs, it's fine. Just You stay over there and just get eaten, it's fine. No problem, no problem. Number seven, unhooded Sith. Circumcision is important in a lot of cultures of yesterday and today. Now at this channel, my job is to come out here every week and make you laugh. So to the men out there who still have their Jedi robes, imagine every day of your life you got sand in places that sand shouldn't be. Anakin Skywalker's worst nightmare and honestly explains why he hates sand so much. But perhaps one of the reasons Egyptians used this hygiene service was to stop sand getting in their wiener's one-eyed bandit. There's no showers, nothing to really get it out once it's in there. That's no good. I guess you could take a dip in the Nile River, but uh, there's too many crocodiles in there, and who has the time to jump in the Nile River when they're busy being forced to build large structures that will stand the test of time? So you better line up, fellas, or be cursed to feel like Anakin Skywalker for the rest of your life. The prequel one, too, not the, not the cool animated one, the one that whines a lot. That one. You don't want to be that one. Number six, nice dentist. Turns out not all Egyptian dentistry is completely awful. It turns out they may have come up with the first toothbrush. Other civilizations had examples of one too, so it's hard to tell exactly, but the Egyptians had one. But one thing they did have over everyone else were Tic Tacs, or breath mints, actually. Honestly, this makes a lot of sense. Imagine it was Valentine's Day. You just walked past a large pyramid. There's sand in places on your body where sand just shouldn't be. When you notice the smell of your breath, and it's something awful. But not to worry, because you purchase breath mints from the market. Yes, that's right. Now smooching with your Egyptian sweetheart can go on without a hitch. 
The mints were made from nice smelling herbs and mints, sometimes roasted over a fire to form little candies. An ancient Egyptian solution to an ancient Egyptian problem. I kinda like that one actually, kinda nice. Could put a mint in, it's kinda nice. Number five. What? Well, I didn't have any corn? Austin Powers reference for you. You know the character I'm talking about, I can't say it. Here's a hygiene product that just makes me question life. The very fabric of our existence. Whether it was the Big Bang or the Almighty Creator, there's just no way this was ever meant to happen. I just, it doesn't make any sense. One day, somebody was walking along the Nile River and was unfortunate enough to step in crocodile droppings. Now, most people would say, gross, and move on. Oh, no, not the people of ancient Egypt. They felt the stinky, squishy unholiness on their feet and said, yes, we must bathe in this. <laughs> and they did. They took the forbidden mud bath, the brown tsunami, the cesspit of no hope. You can call it whatever you want, really, it's, it's horrible either way you look at it. Supposedly it was meant to keep you young and beautiful. My only question would be at what point did they realize poo baths were a mistake? Was it when they were smelling it and it was bad? Or was it when it accidentally got in your mouth or something like that and you're just like, oh, what? It, it walked up that out of my mouth. That's the Scottish Egyptian, in case you were wondering. Number four, waste removal. This one is kind of a broad stroke, but hear me out. There's no plumbing, no waste removal, and people kind of just go wherever they want. A lot of that unhygienic waste is kind of just laying about. However, the people of Egypt also had the advantage of the Nile River, which means they used that bad boy for everything. Transport, irrigation, a water source, and of course, a, a bathroom. Which, in case you didn't know, your source of water and irrigation should be two separate, that, that shouldn't be, they shouldn't go together, that's not good. This is a good explanation for the plagues of Egypt, besides the sin, bad sinners, no sinning. As years of that kind of negligent waste management are liable to make any pharaoh sick. Don't mix your water with the poo, don't do that, that's bad, don't do that. Number three, sunscreen. This should come as no secret to anyone out there, but with my rosy cheeks and fair complexion, I would not do very well in the suns of ancient Egypt. Honestly, I don't know how Luke Skywalker lived on Tatooine with those twin sons. Without a little copper tone action, you know what I'm saying? The Egyptians had an answer to that problem, however. Not the whole living on Tatooine part, that, that just kind of sucks no matter what. Blue milk is weird. They had a makeshift sunscreen using rice bran extracts and a few other ingredients that were meant to help protect against the sun's rays. How effective was it really? Not sure, because the only stuff I'm willing to test out is the real stuff. And if I get burnt, then I start peeling. And then somebody has to rub aloe vera all over me. Be right back, I'm gonna get some sun. Number two, cursed craft dinner. You've got no plumbing in your palace, and it's time for dinner. So how does an Egyptian royal make his favorite pot of KD without water? I mean, if college kids can do it in their dorm room, surely they can master the art of post-secondary cuisine. Well, for some unlucky folks, it means taking a pot and walking down to that old Nile River. Almost like people rely on water or something. And take a big scoop of water and bring it back. But while you begin to scoop some water, you may notice someone is picking up crocodile dung. And people are bathing in the water. And, and to your left, there's a maiden washing clothes. And to your right, there's a man doing something I can't repeat on YouTube. Oh well, time to scoop some more water up and consume this clean, nice water at home. Oh, this is the best. Tastes like the village. It's nice. Number one, pink milkshake. Does it still count as hygiene if you ain't breathing? I say yes. Besides the pyramids and maybe the Nile, mummies are the most famous things about Egypt. And in a weird way, it is hygiene. Hygiene for the afterlife. When someone super important passes on, it's time for a little game of operation. Stomach, liver, intestines are removed and put into jars. You never know when you might need that next. The heart is left because it's the heart and the Egyptians were die-hard poets, so you got souls in there, you gotta keep that. The most grim process to me, however, is turning the human brain into a forbidden milkshake by mashing it with a small spike and then draining it out in what must have been the grossest waterfall ever. Oh God, that just, oh God, that's so gross. <laughs> anyway, then you take some linen and start wrapping the mummy up like a dad wrapping last minute gifts on Christmas Eve. 